Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning session. My name is Angela Young, and I am the co-founder of Art Hive Magazine, and I'm very excited to welcome all of you this morning to Business Skills for the Modern Creator, presented by the Broward County Cultural Division. So today is session number three. And just so you know, every other Saturday this summer, we'll be bringing you two presentations on how artists and creatives, just like all of you out there, can launch and grow your own careers. So just so you know, our first session was on business basics, and our last session was on branding and marketing. And if you missed it, don't worry. You can find all of those resources right where you're watching right now, whether it's through Facebook, or through YouTube of Broward Arts. So I want to mention some really important things before we get started. Um, first, if you are joining us live, you can use the chat box and you can share your name, your creative practice, your medium, where you're joining us from. You can use that to interact with us. And also, go down into the description box um, of where you're watching from, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook, and there are some materials on there that are for the protecting rights section, and that'll be coming on after the break, but just so you know, they're there for you there. So, and also very important, we're gonna take a break in between the sessions of both speakers, so don't worry, you'll have time to refill on your coffee. So, without further ado, I want to tell you a little bit about our first speaker, Rafael Cruz, and he is speaking on choosing a business structure and creating a business plan. So since he is diving into the content of developing a business structure, Rafael is first gonna walk you through all of the steps and at the end, he will take all of your questions. So let me tell you a little bit about Rafael. Rafael, is the executive consultant for the Florida Small Business Development Center at Florida Atlantic University, serving Broward and Palm Beach counties. He is frequently invited to give keynote addresses and to be a part of distinguished panels on entrepreneurship, small business development, and economic development. Rafael has served on the decision panels for the Miami Herald's annual business plan challenge, the Broward Cultural Innovation Hub Career Store Startup Now program, and the, and the Children's Service Council Capacity Building Grant. He has appeared on television, radio, and in print to share information about successful entrepreneurial strategies to grow a profitable business. He works one-on-one -on -one with entrepreneurs and business owners on critical aspects of running and growing a successful business. And some key areas is, of his expertise are international trade, government contracting, creative economy, strategic planning, financing, and access to capital. So without further ado, I'd like to add Rafael to bring you the presentation. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Uh, I wanna thank you all uh, for joining us, okay, this morning. Um, <clears throat> let me just shift this. So. There we go. All right, I want to thank Art Hive and uh, Angela for, for uh, this uh, presentation opportunity. And of course, I want to thank uh, Broward County Cultural Division right, for the wonderful work they do bringing uh, creativity and uh, art uh, to our lives down here in Broward County. I really appreciate the work they do and the team we have over there. Um, <clears throat> if you hear me cough, don't worry. It's just my allergies acting up a little bit because of dust and so on. It's my allergy season. So, uh, But today, what we're talking about is choosing a business entity and a little bit of business planning all right and choosing a business entity is is really about two things okay and, and let's get those two things on so next slide please <clears throat> the first thing is liability oops there we go uh, liability um in in uh, i'm not a lawyer we're not giving you legal advice but liability generally turns out to um if you can be sued or not all right so there's liability and the second thing is next slide Taxes, okay, how you want to be taxed, all right? <clears throat> now, there's some conversations that you're going to be having with some professionals on your team, all right? We're going to get into those in a minute, okay? But <clears throat> so two things you want to think about, again, are liability 
and taxation. How do I want to be taxed? Okay. And how much liability, you know, am I willing to take on? Okay. How much risk am I willing to take on? All right. So next slide, please. <clears throat> then what you're deciding is, do I want to operate individually by myself or as a group? Right. I'll tell you now, for most of you, you're going to want to go towards the group eventually, the group model eventually, uh, and that's because you're going to bring people on to, to assist you maybe in your marketing or in your PR. You might have some employees or so on and so forth. You want to have that, you want to have that ability to do that, okay? So <clears throat> choosing this entity allows you some type of uh, protection, liability, and also is talking about how we're going to be taxed. Next slide. So if you're a sole proprietor, and guess what? You're all a sole proprietor, whether you know it or not. If you're operating and you're selling things and you haven't made a choice, then you get treated as a sole proprietor. And as you see here, guess who gets to do everything? <clears throat> okay, you get to do everything, right? You get to control. You have all the liability. See that arrow going down the middle there? You pay the taxes, okay? <clears throat> and... That's okay if you're having an operation that's really, really small, all right? But for most of you, you do want some liability protection, all right? So next slide. That's where we get to the, the famous Inc., right? Incorporated. Now, there's two kinds. You see there's a C there and there's an S. Um, the S is smaller, right? There's a reason for that. <coughs> Excuse me. The C is the big corporation that we think of when we think of big corporations, okay, your IBMs, your Fords, your General Motors, those kind of things like that, right? For most of you out there, C Corporation won't be the first choice that you make because you're not going to be that big, okay? And there's an issue that you will discuss with your CPA called double taxation that you don't want to get into. So S Corporation is generally the way to go for smaller operations, okay? And S Corporation, all right? Gives you the liability protection, okay? <clears throat> now, next slide, please. When we think about corporations, of course, we think about stock, okay? And that's one of the things that corporations can do is they can sell, uh, they can sell stock or a piece of the equity, a piece of the ownership, right? So you can have a business and you own 95% of it and you sold 5% to someone else, okay? So that money comes into your business and helps you, right? <clears throat> next slide. But it's really a liability where the corporation really comes into play, all right? It protects you because what's invested in the corporation now is what's at risk. So your personal finances and your personal, your home, for instance, and things like that, those can't be, no one can come after those, all right, if something happens within the corporation, okay? So there's that liability, that protection. Now, you notice there's three little piggies there, and that's to remind us that there's three people that you want to have on your team. Three professionals. This is not any order, but it's very important if you're working to develop your career, you're working to develop your, your, your craft, you still want to have these folks around you and you want to get to know them now. The earlier, the better. Okay. And first one is, of course, a CPA. Good CPA that knows your industry, knows art, creativity, knows these things as an industry, uh, perhaps has other clients that, that does art. Okay, the creative types so that they know how to handle and work with you. So your CPA will help you in questions of taxation. They help you get your finances in order and get your financial reporting in order. Very, very important. Okay. <clears throat> the next one, okay, is you need a very good lawyer, right? Can you go back to that other slide, please, with the little piggies? Right, you need a good lawyer, okay, to help you get through <clears throat> legal challenges when you have contracts you want them to be able to review those contracts for you so it's your cpa your lawyer and eventually you're going to need a banker okay you have to get to know a banker as you grow your business every business at some point needs capital injection some money coming in right and you may need to get a loan you don't want to talk to a banker the day before you need the loan all right next slide okay so here you see the two forms right top one is u.s corporation income tax return that's what you would do okay, for the C corporation and the 1040 is what you all do, what we all do, all right, individual tax forms, okay. Now, what makes a corporation a corporation is, next slide, next slide, thank you, formalities, okay, James Bond, there he is, nice and formal, 
Okay, what are your formalities? What are your corporate formalities? Well, these are things that you have to do, all right, to, to maintain the status of being a corporation, okay? And it's your state, wherever you are, it's your state that gives you this, this, this designation as a corporation, all right? Next slide. And one of the first formalities is what? Separation of personal and corporate finances. You want to have two separate bank accounts. Uh, you don't want to be mixing. You, know, you don't want to use your personal credit card to buy things for the business. Now, this gets tricky in, in uh, some cases, okay, when it comes to um, people that are doing creative stuff. You know, um, you go to Home Depot, let's say, to buy some wood to create some kind of a sculpture, and you buy something else, all right, let's say for the home. Use two separate credit cards for that, two separate financial structures for that, okay? Two separate bank accounts. So you want to have those separate. Next slide. Corporation, you have to file your paperwork, okay? You have to do your taxes, all right? You have to make sure that the state paperwork that the state is asking you for is in and it's in on time, okay? So that you don't lose your designation, all right? In terms of your corporation now being null and void because you didn't follow through with your paperwork. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> and of course, you have to have regular meetings. Some of you may be thinking, well, it's only me, Rafael. You know, how can I have a meeting with myself? Well, I remember the three people I told you to have uh, you know, on your team there. Okay, when you have a meeting with your CPA, you write that down. Keep a log of all your meetings. You write it down, the date, time, what you discussed. Okay, you have a meeting with your lawyer, your banker, okay, a business advisor. You keep that down, right? And then you can show that. Okay, as proof of these are these are the meetings that we have, regular meetings that we have. If there is more than one of you, corporate, you have a meeting quarterly, and you discuss things about the business, which direction we're going to go, or we're going to accept this contract or not, you keep a record of those. Keep it in a file online and in a hard hard copy file. There you go. Now you have your record of your meetings. Again, these are formalities. Remember the bank account, paperwork, meeting, right? And that's the corporation, right? That's that C and that S, corporation. Now, what happened is over time, people wanted flexibility, okay, and how they had their taxes, but they still wanted the liability protection. So thus was born the LLC. Next slide. Okay. The LLC, what it did was it allowed you to be taxed as a partnership, okay, but have the protection of a corporation. The, the challenge with a partnership is, you know, it's two or more people, but in a partnership, everybody has full liability. So if I'm a partner with somebody else and we get a loan from the bank for $100,000 and they go to Las Vegas and they spend all that $100,000 and not spend it, lose it, okay, gambling, <clears throat> I am liable for that also, all right? So people didn't like that side of the partnership, but they liked the way you can be taxed. So next slide. LLC offering you flex flexibility, right? There you go. Next slide, please. So you can see that the LLC now what it does is allows you to be taxed as what's called flow through that top section there you can be as a sole proprietorship as an individual as a partnership two or more individuals okay or as an s corporation which is called the semi flow through uh way of being taxed again remember you're going to be talking about this with your cpa each of you have a very nuanced and individual as as individual as you are that's your tax situation also it's very individual and all of you have a different plan of how you want to go about things. So this is why you talk to these advisors about these personal things, okay? Um, this is general information, so it's getting you to think about how you want to do these things, okay? But you have to have these discussions with your, your tax advisors, all right? So how you want to be taxed. And then the third way that you can be taxed as an LLC, okay, is you can be taxed as a corporation. Now, here's a pro tip. LLC does not stand for Limited Liability Corporation. Stands for limited liability company, okay? Limited liability company. A lot of people say limited liability corporation. You don't want to make that mistake, all right? Because <clears throat> we just don't want to. We don't want to do it, all right? So that's that's overall the choices that you have when it comes to an entity. Um, there's not that many choices, but the decisions that you make become very very important in terms of the liability protection. So you want to be at least some type of an Inc, an S, maybe corporation, or an LLC will probably work for most of you out there. 
unless you're operating very, very small or you're just getting started and you're not sure if you're going to take this into a really serious business type of situation or you're just going to do it as something that you love and then every once in a while you sell a piece, all right, then you may want to operate as a sole proprietor, all right? But for most of you, for the liability protection, it's worth it to become at least an S corporation or LLC, okay? So that's it for our, our uh, choosing a business entity and giving you a roundabout on that, okay? Now, our next subject, next slide. <clears throat> now, this is business planning. And you notice that I didn't say business plan. There, 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 there's an important reason for that, okay? Business plan, people think of something that they write for a professor or they write down and, and, and nobody ever reads them. And that's not what we're talking about here. This is more because you can get online any type of outline of a business plan that you want. It, it, it doesn't make a difference what you get. Um, it's sort of for those of you that are writers, okay, you can give me a ton of outlines on how to put a novel together. I still have to come up with the story. I have to come up with the characters and the settings and everything else to make it a novel. So an outline doesn't help me, okay, if I don't have what's necessary to put in that outline. So business planning, we turn it into a verb, it's a thought process, the way you think about things. So that's what we're going to try to do today is we're going to try to work with some, some, some ways that we think, all right, to help us move along. Now, as we go with this, <clears throat> I want you to think about something here that's important. Think about a project. Think about your next project. Don't think about your business and how it's going to be 50 years from now. That, that's, that's too much. Relax. Take it easy. Let's think about your next project, the next show you're going to put on, the next thing you're going to do. Okay? <clears throat> next slide, please. I want you to take a minute to just, just absorb this, this quote. Okay? Because what we want to do is, is, is we want to make things simple, okay, but not simplistic. They don't have to be complicated. They don't have to be overly done. Okay, think of this. If you answer the couple of questions I'll ask you throughout here, you'll have a draft of a draft of a business plan, and then you can develop on top of that. Okay, so I like that part about it. He says an artist is, is a man or woman, okay, who says a difficult thing in a simple way through their creativity. Through the, the artists interpret for us difficult um, feelings, emotions, uh, and we're living through some you know, challenging times now, pandemic and so on and so forth. So we're looking to you, the artists, the creative folks, to help us understand these things, okay, to simplify these things for us and make clear the way for us, okay? So next slide. Now to put you at ease, okay, some of you may have had a lemonade stand when you were young, all right? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, Everything that you need to know about business, you can, you can learn from running a, a lemonade stand, if you believe it or not. I mean, everything on the table there, okay, you see the big lemonade sign with the price there? That's your marketing and your pricing right there, okay? So your marketing, branding, okay? You have your raw materials right on top. You have a lemon, sugar, water, okay? You have your money up there. That's your profit, all right? You have the sugar sweetener so you can change it to the taste of folks. Some people like a little more sour somehow. So, and you're on a, on a roadway there, so you're getting, you're getting your foot traffic, all right? So there's a lot of things you can learn just from a little, little lemonade stand, okay? But we want to start big, okay? Remember, I said think about your next project, all right? So, next slide. So what is that? What's your next project? I'm asking you a question so you write it down. Don't, don't send us a chat. Write it down. Take a piece of paper and a pencil and write this down for yourself. What is the idea? Now, here's one of the challenges. I've been working with creatives for a long, long time. And here's one of the challenges that I hear from them often. And this may be true for you, too. They have a lot of ideas, a ton of ideas. So what I like to say, tell them, listen, let's pick one. Let's work on that until we get it to realization. And the other ones, as they come to you, keep an idea journal. Keep an idea log. So they won't get lost. They won't, they won't fly away from you. But you don't have to hold them into your head. But it's very, very difficult to work on 15 things at the same time. Usually that's a recipe for not doing well at anything, okay? And for some people, it's a good excuse not to be good at what you want to be good at. So let's pick one idea. Let's pick the one thing, commit to it now, okay? And how are you going to move forward? And here's a different way of thinking about that idea. Next slide. Think about it this way. Okay, here she is doing math. She's solving a problem, right? How does your art, 
How does the work that you do, your creativity, how does it solve a problem? Either an individual's problem, a person, individual problem, a societal problem, a global problem. Now, we have a lot of these to choose from, so there's tons of them out there for you, okay? But that idea of yours, how does it solve a problem, okay? How does it solve a problem? Right. I want you to think about that for a moment. Take your time. Take 30 seconds right now. Give yourself this time. Saturday morning, we're here together talking about you. You're taking a big step here to move yourself forward in terms of your career, in terms of thinking like a business. And this is how we think when we think business. All we're doing is increasing your paradigm, increasing your ability to think in a different way. Okay? So when we say, how do you solve a problem? We're saying, what is it that your art does? Okay, that solves a problem for someone. What does your creativity do that solves a problem for someone? Now, the next thing you want to think about, you want to jot down if you're if you're following along with us, right? Next slide. Who do I solve this problem for? Who are the individuals? Who, who are the people that I solve this problem for? Now you want to get very specific here. This is where you get into, into knowing the demographics, age. Okay, education level, income level, these kind of things. But you can do that research later. But you should have a feeling for who your art appeals to, who you want it to appeal to. And guess what? It's not everybody. Not everybody's going to like everything that you do. Not everyone can afford what you do. So it's not everybody. We have to become narrow in our focus again. More focused, okay, the better and more likely we are to succeed, right? Now, after you have those three, those, those three concepts, the idea, what's the problem that we solve, and who we solve it for, next slide. Now we're ready to jot this down in a plan, okay? Why, why write it down? Okay, oh, Rafael, you know, we're in the, we're in the fast times now, right? 2.0, 2.0, 3.0. Let's just move it. Why are we writing things down? As soon as I write it, down is obsolete. You're right. It is obsolete. But it's the discipline of going through that practice that helps you. The plan is not for me or anybody else. Now, even though I'll, we'll explain to you, business plans are used for two, two serious things. One is to keep the owners and the team honest as they move forward in the business. And two is to bring other people that we want into the team. So investors, bankers, so on and so forth. The business plan keeps everybody on the same page as we move forward. And it tells a story of what we're doing so people that are going to invest can understand that story and make a good, wise choice to invest in us. Okay, so that's the reason of a business plan, and that's why we write it down, ultimately. Okay, next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I like Star Trek. I hope some of you do, too. But here we are. Here you are, Captain Kirk, and you're flying the ship. And every other episode of your Star Trek fan, you know, Captain Kirk was threatening to blow up the ship. So what do you need around you? You need a great team. And if you're going to threaten to blow up the ship, then you need somebody like Mr. Spock, who's very logical and very calm, says, Captain, calm down. We don't have to blow the ship up, okay? So you have to know your strengths, and you have to work around them. You don't want a team of people that are just like you. You want a team of people that complement you. Those of you that understand color, understand music, okay, uh, <clears throat> compliments, all right? It's, it's, it's uh, not the opposite necessarily, but it's the piece that you're missing. Right, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, if you're flying around the universe and you're talking to all types of different aliens and things like that, then you need a who are right there behind you translate. Okay, so who who are who are the people on your team? And how are you going about getting those people okay to, to be on your team? Right. So again, we talked about a couple of people on the team already, right? Our CPA, our lawyer, our banker, right? And then we go from there. Now all of you have people on your team already. You may not know it. I mean, for many of you, um, the, the, your first and, and most most ardent team members were your parents, all right? Or maybe some other loved one in your family that supported your creativity when other people didn't, okay? So that's that's a team member right there. They, they've been on the team since day one, okay? They saw it in you. They loved it in you. They nurtured it in you, and, and you're grateful to them. Many of you, you know, you write your book, and you dedicate it to them. Those people on your team. The other people on your team are the people that you call in the middle of the night when you're thinking about something and they answer the phone, okay? They're your mentors, they're your supporters, right? <clears throat> Those are people on your team. Don't discount that. We're not just talking about legal advisors and, and tax advisors. 
We're talking about the people that really support you in your creativity. That's your team. Okay. And you write those down a little, little one or two sentences about what they do for you and how they do for it, because this is important. You cannot do everything alone and it's difficult to be successful alone. Very, very difficult. All right. Even as an artist. Okay. Next slide, please. Now here's the thing that, that um, when we work with creatives, okay, sometimes creatives shy away from this, right? Oh, I don't want to be a sellout. Oh, I don't, you know, it's not about the money. It's about the passion. You're right. But for now, we're talking about this growing into a business. And business, the language of business is numbers and, and, and money. So what we want to do is, how is it that you convert, okay, materials and things like that into money? How does it make money? Okay, a business makes money. That's what a business does. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? And the assumption I'm making is if you're listening in today, right, you're, you're either emerging artist, you're just starting out, you want to know, listen, I really want to put this uh, to the test here, and I want to see if I can, I can make it as an artist, right? So we have to get serious about how much money do we want to make? How much can we make? Okay, next slide. Money again, Rafael? Yes, but this time we're talking about profit. There's a difference between how we make the money and profit. Profit is what we keep at the end of it, right? Profit is what we keep at the end of it. How much are, are, are we keeping from what we make? There's an old saying in business, it's not what you make, it's what you keep that matters, right? Because you can make a lot of money, but if you spend it all running the business and on materials and on things like that, well, guess what? You're not keeping anything, okay? So then the business is not doing what it's supposed to do for you, right? Many of you are, are very, very, very gifted people. So therefore, you can go and work for someone else. But you're doing this, you're taking this big risk on yourself, okay, and in yourself. So we want to make sure that you get a return on this investment. Now, just to give you an overall thing, you can research this later, but the United States stock market, okay, and we're talking about the, the, the top of the line stocks, all right, <clears throat> NASDAQ index and things like this, okay, they give back about 9 to 11% over any 25 to 30 year period. That means if you invest $100,000, Okay, or one dollar after a certain amount of time, you get between nine and eleven percent return. Why am I bringing this up? This return on investment idea, this profit idea, is because you want to have some ideas, some number ideas in your mind when you're developing your business plan, because you have to have some kind of expectation. And if the if a good stable stock is going to give you between nine and eleven percent, then either you can invest your money in there in, in that stock, right, and not worry about all of this, or you say how much return investment am I expecting from my business? That's the reason that you have this in your mind, okay? So you want a little bit more than 11% is what you're expecting, right? Now, don't sweat these numbers too much because we can figure out, you can always figure out the numbers after. It's more important to have that idea, the problem solving, the people, and a couple of the other things we're gonna talk about before you get into these numbers, all right? Don't worry about the numbers. The numbers actually are, are not the hard part of doing a business plan. It's the parts that we're talking about. Next slide, please. Now, every time you see these lemons, that just means we're going to switch. Okay, a second. Take a breather. Ah, a little bit of information there. Okay, a little bit of vitamin C, nice bright lemon, right? So next concept here. Next slide, please. This now is where you're the expert. Okay, a penguin is perfect for its environment. You must know your environment. What does that mean? Um, some of you will agree with this and some of you won't, uh, but I'm going to say it anyway, okay? Um, if you're a musician, we expect you to know music. If you're an artist, we expect you to know art, and we expect you to know it in a way that the average person doesn't know it, to know it deeply, to know it intimately, okay? The way uh, we expect, all right, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we expect someone that lives in the Arctic to understand the Arctic, all right? They say folks that are, that are indigenous to the Arctic, have many, many different words for snow. I know snow as snow. They have many different words for snow, okay? So a penguin knows uh, their environment. You have to be the expert in your industry. You have to be the expert in your environment, okay? Next slide. And when we say know what we mean really know it, okay? We expect a doctor, surgeon to understand surgery, the history of surgery, so on and so forth. So we should hold artists, professional artists, to the same standard. We expect a lawyer to know law. 
okay, very deep and profoundly. So that's that point there. So you have to be the one often that educates people in reason, reading your business plan or educate people that you meet about art, about creativity, about the history of it, about why it's important, okay, why we still need it, why it should be funded, all these different things. Because if you don't know, trust me, no one else knows. Okay, next slide, please. I saw this slide and, and I just had to, I, it, was, it was just so phenomenal. And it reminds me of the question for you is, and answer this question right now. What makes you unique? I mean, that's a unique bicycle. I, I mean, I, I, I just I just love it, the design of it, the colors. It's, it's unique. Now, I don't know if I can ride it without falling down, but boy, is it unique. Okay, so what is it about you and what you do that's unique, that's one of a kind, that's special? Okay, and, and, and we all are, okay? Uh, we can talk about it on a molecular level and things like that. We don't have to. Okay, as artists, you know and you appreciate the uniqueness of, of, of the gift of creativity. Not everybody has that, and you do. Okay, so I want you to jot down, really take a second here, be, be honest with yourself, and, and write down right now, okay, what makes you unique? What makes you different, all right? And when we say unique and special, we don't mean better than someone else. We just mean unique and special. And it's okay to be unique and special. Uh, someone else is unique and special for their own thing. What are you unique, unique and special for, right? Now that's you. Okay, now next slide. Now everything else I'm gonna talk about from now on is gonna be about somebody other than you. Because really a business is not just, it's not about you and what the business can do for you, but it's what about you can do for others. So, what is, what is the experience that you want to have people to have when they engage with your art, with your creativity, with what you've created, with the story you wrote, okay, the show that you put on? What is the experience? Now, here's a way that you can jot this down and think about it. Think about emotion words. Answer this question. My art makes people feel what? How do you make people feel? Happy, engaged, confused, challenged, annoyed. Pick one or two, three words, okay, of how you want people to experience an emotion when they're in the presence of what you've created. This is very important because this is the foundation, okay, of your marketing and branding plan. All right, so those of you that saw marketing branding um, a couple of weeks ago, and those of you that will talk about it later on, okay, as you develop your business plan, you develop your business, right? It's the experience that we want people to have that we're talking about, right? And if you look at other businesses, they are trying to get you to have a certain experience, okay? So what's the experience? Jot that down, right? Next slide. And this is just simply stated, what's the promise? What is the promise that you make, okay, to the people that, that, that engage with your art, that buy your art? What is the promise that you make? I promise to what? What is it that you're promising them? You have to be clear on the promise because that way you can keep the promise. If you're not clear on the promise that you're making when you engage with somebody in this, in this artistic experience, especially if you're the type of artist that sells, you know, uh, let's say you're a visual artist and selling paintings, and <clears throat> you want somebody to buy more than one painting. Obviously, you hope that they become a patron and a collector of your work uh, and a real advocate of what you're doing and what you're saying, right? But what's the promise that you make? You know, are you promising that they'll have a life-altering experience, okay? A deep emotional connection. What is the promise that I'm making to, the, to this individual, right? So take again a second to jot this down. This is for you. No one else has to see these things that you're jotting down now. This is, this is very much for you in terms of being the draft of your business plan. All right, next slide, please. There's our lemons again. Take a second and breathe. Ah, okay. Now, there's some other folks on the outside and depends on how you go about you know, dealing with them. Okay, <clears throat> I'll tell you how I like to deal with them. Next slide. Competition, right? But just like these kids, you know, we can compete and have fun. It doesn't have to be about a battle, right? It doesn't have to be head-to-head, -head, boom, 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 
No, 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 no. That's not that's not the way I would uh, advise you as, as your business advisor. I would not advise you to go out and think about things. Oh, that, that competition. I have to eat the competition. No, 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 no. That's that's all movie making, you know, boo-ha-ha kind of stuff. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. All right. Um, when we talk about the competition, right, what we're talking about is, is something a lot more important. Okay, next slide. We're talking about learning from our competition. Okay, what are their strengths? What makes them great? Okay, what, what makes them, why are they our competition? Why do we even look at them as competition? We're looking at them as competition because they're doing what we want to do and they're doing it well. So you want to take from the competition in your business plan, you want to have at least three competitors. And I know what some of you may be thinking, oh, you know, I'm an artist and I don't have competition. Yes, you do. What I mean by that is this. I can spend $10,000 on your art or on somebody else's art. So whether you think of yourself as competing with the other artists, we're still competing for that $10,000, okay? If you're going for a $10,000, $100,000 grant, it's competition, right? So, but we want to learn from the competition. What are they doing correctly? What are they doing well, okay? Uh, what can I learn from them? Is there a possibility I can partner with them? Okay, we can work together and go after a bigger grant. That's the way I advise that you go with your, your competition, not a head-to-head -head, try to take them out of the game. No, work with them. If you were there helping her lift, you can lift double what she's lifting. Okay, and you both get the gold medal. Right, next slide. And then we want to look at the weakness. What is the weakness in the competition? And when we say weakness, again, we're not looking to take anyone out of the game. What we're looking for is what is it that they're not doing that perhaps I can do? And when I say not doing is what market or what group of people, what problems are they not solving that I can solve? That's a weakness in the competition. They're not solving this problem. I make cars. My cars have big engines and use a lot of gasoline. Well, I am not making electric cars. Well, here you come and you say, well, I can either compete and go head to head making big gas guzzling cars, or I can start making electric cars. That market is not being served. That's a weakness on my part because I'm not doing it, but that's an opportunity your part. So by analyzing our competition and seeing where they're not, that might present you with an opportunity. Okay, so that's when we look at strengths and weaknesses there when we talk about, okay, our, our competition. Next slide. All right. Now, I'm going to ask you a question here because some of you at this point have a little bit of water here. Okay. Let's take a little water. Next slide, please. So I'm selling water, folks. Okay, and I want to see how much, um, how many of you are thirsty or you, you need another cup of coffee. So I'm selling water at $64 a gallon. And I have coffee, uh, uh, six dollars for four ounces, or one hundred and ninety-two dollars a gallon. Um, I want to know if anybody wants to buy some water from me. Want to want to buy some coffee from me? Uh, it's on sale. It's it's really good prices. Any takers? Usually, I don't get my, many takers for this. Okay, and I'm not sure why. Next slide, please. We we've already bought the coffee at those prices, the water at those prices, right? <clears throat> and and what's the difference between this image and the last image. Okay, next slide. Branding, right? So uh, some things don't need a brand. You know, babies are cute without brands. They don't need a brand. Um, they, they are their own brand, baby brand, right? Uh, beautiful and, 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 and I love babies. I love children, so you'll excuse me. All right, you'll see a lot of children images here because I, I, I like kids, okay? Um, I have a daughter and, and I, I like kids, okay? <clears throat> so. When we talk about branding, let, let me explain to you. Okay, next slide, please, where, where it comes from a little bit, all right? Um, branding actually comes from the cattle industry, all right, um, where they would grow, you know, they would raise cattle in the western part of the United States, and then they would brand it, okay? So you'd have an image of brand, and it was usually some letters or things like that on the cattle, right? And then they would, that cattle would be walked, okay? And the cowboys would walk it, okay, to the market. Right, usually in the middle of the country, Midwest. Okay, so that what happened was when I saw a cattle with a certain brand, that brand indicated quality. So when we talk about brands, we're actually talking about quality. Okay, so when you see these four different brands, they all exist in the same space, automobile industry.
But if you look at them, each of you know that each of these stand for something different. But unless we're an engineer, can we really tell the difference between how well an Audi or a Lexus or a Bentley or Rolls Royce is in terms of performance? Especially when in the United States, everybody has to meet certain minimum standards to even be sold. So the brakes and the engine and everything have to meet certain emissions control standards, so on and so forth. But each of these companies spends a lot of money to get you to believe that each of these brands stands for a different level of quality and a different experience. That's the important thing. You're getting to buy into an experience. So when you talk about your brand and you build your brand, again, we go back to the concept of what is the experience, okay? So next slide, please. I want you to take a look at this, okay, because many of you know this, this brand. Cartier, they make watches and, and other things, but you know this brand, okay? Next slide. <clears throat> But you may not know these brands, okay? And, and as I did research for this, I was surprised to find out, okay, because I, I, I just researched, you know, most expensive watches, okay? And believe it or not, the particularly uh, on, on uh, the, your, um, <clears throat> if you're looking at this left side, and the Vacheron Constantin on the right side, both of those model watches, on the left side one, that's the front and back. So the front of it has the white dial, the back of it has that blue star, uh, and then, the, the Vacheron uh, uh, Constantine, okay, is a complicated one on, on the right-hand side. Okay, both of those watches cost more than a million dollars. They take over a year to make, they're handmade, okay, and it takes about two to three years on a waiting list to get them. What I was surprised about is that there were more than one person making million-dollar watches, okay? I don't own one, so don't worry about that, <laughs> okay? And if I did, I'd be, I'd be scared to wear it, right? It's a million-dollar watch, okay? But the point here is that if there's more than one person making million dollar watches, there's room enough in the market for all of us, okay, and our creativity and what we're doing too, all right? But each of these, okay, have built up over time a brand and they have a loyal following. People wait for years to get one of these watches, right? So when we talk about brands, next slide. Okay, perhaps you know this gentleman, all right? Very, very famous, that's for the opera, so on and so forth, all right? So why am I bringing this up? Because now we're coming back into the creative sphere. We talked about cars, we talked about watches. All right, yeah, Rafa, but you know, we're in the creative field, you know? Well, theater is one of the most challenging fields in the arts, all right? Um, it's, it's very risky. You don't know if the show, if people are gonna love it or hate it, you know, the critics are gonna write. Um, there's so many things involved, there's so many different layers, okay? So many things that you have to work with uh, when you're doing theater. The, the show is live, all right? Um, so there's there's practical things like electricity and, and so on, and the air conditioning in the theater and so on, and then keeping the actors. And, and there's so many things in theater, all right? So when we talk about something like Phantom, I've right, just been around for such a long time. Okay, next slide, please. This is the amazing, from the business side of it, right? Think about what this says. The Phantom Rapper may be the most successful entertainment franchise of all time. It's grossed $5.6 billion worldwide. It's more than Avatar, more than Titanic, more than Star Wars. Okay? 130 million people have seen it. All right? 28 countries, 148 cities, and 13 languages. Now, now imagine the impact that this one creative act has had on so many different people. And, and, and just giving them an experience, a once-in-a-lifetime experience, okay? So now theater for a while, right, had a downturn, okay? And then came along a young man. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, does anybody recognize this young man? Okay, if you have Disney Plus, you know, uh, um, <clears throat> you know that uh, Disney has one of his, his creative projects. Uh, it's running on uh, the Disney uh, uh, streaming network right now, okay? And, and here's a young man who read a book and said, hey, wow, this, this, this is touching me in a different way. I wanna bring this, this, this book, this story about an immigrant, okay, founding father. Uh, I wanna bring this story to a modern audience in a modern voice, okay? But he was very, very true to tradition. So you talk about people that understand their art form 
and understand the history, okay? Uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda understands it very much, okay, next slide. And he brought us, of course, Hamilton, right? I mean, you know, um, one of the most successful shows, you're talking about The Phantom, all right, um, Hamilton has been extremely successful. Uh, it, is, it has changed the way people think about theater or some of the possibilities uh, in theater and different voices uh, and, and the diversity that you can have on stage in theater. So here we have a, a young man and his team that came together and, and read a wonderful book about someone that's important in the history of this country, okay, and brought it to us in a way that was, that was new, but also very reminiscent, okay, of what is traditional and what is important and what, what we love about theater. But again, brought his own style, brought his own, uh, I'll say it, brought his own salsa to it, okay? Uh, and he put that salsa right on top of it and made it something his, right? So, and here's the business side of it. Next slide. <clears throat> investors, Hamilton had investors, Phantom had investors, right? <clears throat> Unprecedented return. Remember that return on investment I talked about? 600%. I said earlier, 9 to 11% are some of the best stocks in the stock market over any, you know, 25 to 30 year period. This show has brought its investors 600% return on investment. So they've invested 12.5 million, but they've made around to date, and I'm not counting what they've made with the Disney deal. Because before the Disney deal, more than half a billion dollars, so more than $500 million Hamilton's have made so far on an investment of 12.5 million. That's an incredible business investment. Okay, it doesn't happen for every theater show, obviously, but it's possible, okay? Next slide. <clears throat> now, we're gonna talk about a fundamental and, and very important aspect of this business. Okay, now we're gonna talk about you, right? It, it's, you wanna be a, uh, next slide. <clears throat> When we talk about the chief executive, the CEO, okay, we're talking about you. Uh, it's easy to put that title. Everybody calls themselves a CEO nowadays. I want you to understand what a CEO is really about, okay, and, and it's chief executive officer, okay? So next slide. Many of us think, or at least um, in shows and things like that, they want us to believe that, you know, as a CEO, you know, here, here I am, I'm Catwoman, right? I'm, I'm I'm a lead character. I'm Batman. I'm, I'm the person that's out there doing the fun things. And, 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 but that's not really the, the best type of leadership, the most effective leadership, okay, is not the leadership that's about you. Next slide. See, this is what CEOs are really about, okay? You're Alfred. Right? You're Batman's butler, okay? You're making sure things run properly. You're taking care of people. Uh, this concept is called servant leadership, all right? It's, it's been around for a long time, okay? And, and <clears throat> it's about being clear as to who we serve and how we serve them, okay, and what we stand for, value. As a chief executive officer, one of the most important things that you're doing is you're developing culture inside of your business. And culture is based on the values. So what are the values of your business? So as you bring people in and onto the team, what are the things they need to understand, how we serve, who we serve, and what we value, right? Because that is really the context and, and the importance of the brand. Otherwise, it's just fluff. It's just stories that we tell that are not important. And, and if you're going to do that, your, your, your time, your energy, and your creativity are much too valuable for that type of surface um, type of activity. You, know, you want something deep. You want something profound, Okay. So I want you, uh, I want to bring into the conversation now some, some you know, leaders, uh, CEOs, uh, uh, very in incredible people, let them speak for themselves. Next slide. Okay, this is Indra Nui, for, former chairman and, and CEO of PepsiCo. I'm gonna let her speak for herself, uh, someone I look up to. All right, next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Now think about what she's saying here. And just because you're a CEO, right? Now, think about how long and how hard it takes to become CEO of a company like PepsiCo. You worked about 20, 30 years to get there. Don't think you have landed. You must continually increase your learning. So as artists, I hope that most of you appreciate that. You're always learning. You're always building. You're always adding to your craft. You're always adding to your, your expertise. 
a little bit of extra knowledge, you know, how do I mix that color? How do I, I put that note in a place that maybe it shouldn't be, but I make it sound well, I make it sound great, okay? Uh, increase your learning. You increase the way you think, the way you approach the organization or your business or your career. That's what you're doing now. What you're doing is you're, you're actually taking that step. You're increasing the way you approach your business, right? Now, she says she's never forgotten that, and I urge you not to forget it, okay? That's the other reason I use a lot of, a lot of, a lot of kids' images, okay, is because you want to keep that childlike innocence in terms of discovery, all right? How is it that I approach things? How am I learning? Okay, next slide, please. And then we have Ursula Burns, another, another CEO I've looked up to for a long time, right? CEO of Xerox. And, and again, this is from a very engineering technical background. Some of you may, you know, have engineering technical backgrounds or, or you're just math people. You love that kind of stuff. You notice her, her trajectory there. <clears throat> she has a bachelor's uh, at, in mechanical engineering and master's in mechanical engineering. And what I like about this story is notice that, that 1980, the first line there, summer intern for Xerox. 2009, CEO, Xerox, okay? <clears throat> so she grew in the company, right? And, and this is an important thing. Let's, let's hear what, what she has to tell us about being a CEO and, and, and the path to success. Next slide, please. Okay, I just, I just love this saying, okay, because it's so great um, uh, because, again, creative people and, and people that are, that are gifted and intelligent and things like that, they tend to have a lot of ideas and, and, and they, they're good at a lot of different things. So what the problem is, is focus. So here she's saying, pick the places you want, that you choose to be great and focus your energies on that, on those things. Understanding that you're not going to be great at everything. She's giving us license. I'm giving you license. To, you don't have to be great at everything. And only you can be great at you. So you should be very, very focused on being great at you. Um, that's very, very important. So even in art, you may want to dabble in different uh, things, but, but become focused on one or two things in your creative endeavors. And really, really be good at that. Okay? And, and let other people be good at uh, some other things and bring them onto the team later. Okay? But the more you try to be great at everything, the more you're going to be mediocre at everything. Right? And then you're watering down your uniqueness and you're watering down the impact that you can have on folks. All right. So, so here is, 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 a, is, a, is a just an, an astonishing person, you know, who's achieved the highest levels of success in terms of the business world. And she's telling us it's okay that we're not perfect. In fact, it's not being perfect that gets us there. All right. And that's what I get from this quote. All right. Next slide, please. So that's what we talk about when we talk about chief executive. Now, that executive word, I want you to focus on it. So next slide. The root of that word is execute, right? So execute is, is about what? What is executing? What is executing? What is it about? Well, let's have a friend explain to us what it's about. Next slide. I also like Star Wars, okay? <laughs> so Yoda, do or do not. There is no try. Executing is about what? It's about getting things done. It's about doing what you said you were going to do when you said you were going to do it. This is one of the secrets of the business plan, right? You write it down. And once you write it down, you sort of made a promise with yourself, haven't you? Right? Even if no one sees that business plan, you know it's there. It's in your drawer. It's in your desk. Uh, you put it away, and it's calling out to you. Saying, remember when you said you were going to do this? Remember. So you have to address it. So you have to do it or you don't do it but you're not trying to do it, okay? So we wanna follow Yoda's advice and we wanna do things. Now, here's the thing um, that I'm gonna give you a bit of advice. <clears throat> Never try to do more than two or three things that are important at any one time. So even a year, if, you have, if you're doing, you know, beginning of the year, the end of the year, you do your annual review and then you look to the next year, <clears throat> you don't wanna write down 15 different things that you're gonna do, no, pick three. And then you might get one done. You pick five, you're gonna get none done. You pick 15, you definitely get none of them done, okay? Because your, your, your focus is going to be all over the place. You're not going to be able to put, put in the energy. Plus, things happen, all right? Uh, we live in Florida down here. Um, hurricanes happen down here, and we're all going through this pandemic, all right? So 
you want to focus on a couple of things that you can put your talent and your creativity and energy into, and then you want to start getting things done, ticking things off your, 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 your to-do list, your action list, getting things done towards the goal that you have chosen based on what you want and how, how you want other people to feel through your gifts, your talents, and your creativity. Right? Next slide, please. And this I thought was interesting. I'm not sure if you all know who David Ogilvy is, but uh, many of you will know who, who he is. Um, <clears throat> the show The Mad Man was based loosely on this era of, of advertising. Uh, advertising meant ad men, because back in those days it was mostly men, right? Um, now we know better, and we have a lot of people involved in, in uh, producing you know, creativity in this, in this arena. But so over, over 50 years ago, um, he was talking about this, right? In the modern world of business, and again, this is a while back, this is not today, it is useless to be a creative original thinker unless you can also sell what you create, right? And what, what was meant by that is not saying that the only value of what you create is unless you can sell it. No, there's, you never sell it, there's still value there. What he's saying, though, is, is in terms of selling, what he's talking about here is not the type of selling where you're, you're trying to get somebody to buy something that they don't need. No, we're not talking about used car sales. No, 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 no. That's not what we're talking about at all. What we're talking about selling is solving people's problems. Your creativity helps people feel good. It solves their problems. It makes their life better. So the selling process is the process that goes from you have made it to getting it to them. That's the bridge, the bridge we call selling. Selling is that process, that bridge from where you are to them. Okay, so that's how I want you to, to think about selling. Right? Not the traditional way that many people think about selling. Okay? Um, selling, every time you try to get somebody to think about something, you're selling an idea. You're selling a, a different perspective. All right? So that's what he meant when he said selling. So we want you to think about this. You took a big step today, a huge step, to join us on a Saturday morning. I mean, to talk about something as exciting as business planning and entities with us. Right? So we know that you're serious about doing this. And we tried to bring some of the best thinkers on this and some of the best ideas to get you thinking in a certain way, okay? Um, um, we want to hear back from some of you. You know, let, let the folks know who are putting this together, uh, if you got some great value out of this. And in terms of if it helped nudge you in terms of thinking about what you're doing in a different way. And some of you actually went along and jotted down some things, all right? So hopefully, next slide. All right, this is what it's about at the end of the day. Right? Why, why pursue art? Why, why pursue your own business? Unless you're going to feel like this. It, it, it's, it's not worth it. I mean, I mean, you can be miserable doing anything. <laughs> um, we don't want that. All right? This is not about making this into, a, into a, a drudgery. No. Have fun. Don't think of this as something you have to do. Think of this as something that you get to do. Wow, I get to write my business plan. How many people don't have that opportunity, right? How many people don't have the opportunity to express themselves through art, okay? To express themselves, all right, through, through their, their creative gift, okay? And, 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 and translate for us regular humans, all right? Um, you know, I, I watch a dancer and, and I'm dancing, okay? And, and um, you know, I can't move like a dancer but when I'm watching a dancer, I'm dancing with them in that moment. Okay, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm watching Hamilton, all right, I can't remember those, those beautiful, you know, poetry and things. But at the moment that I'm listening to it, guess what? I become a rapper. I become a founding father, founding mother. I, I'm part of history. You know, so that's what you creative folks are doing for us. It's important. It's essential. And, and if there's any time that we need it, we need it now. Okay, we've been forced to be separate from each other. Um, we've been forced to, 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 to do things that, as, as humans, we haven't done, okay? Um, there's a lot of fear out there. So please use your creativity, bring your creativity, bring your talents, bring your gifts to bear and help us, all right? Help us get past this, get through this, and heal from this, okay? Because only you can, only you can do it with, with the gifts that you have, and that's why you have them. You know, we, I don't only want you to feel that way, I'm challenging you now to make others feel that way, all right? That, that's the burden of your gift. It's not just for you. A gift is to share, okay? Uh, and that's what we want, okay? That's what we want, all right? That's what we want 
is is can you excuse me? <clears throat> Sorry about that. That was the alarm. Um, what we want is for you, okay, to share your gift. All right. And next slide. You don't have to go this alone. Okay. There's a small business development center in every state in the union. All right. This is my email. Okay. So you can reach out to me or you can reach out to, to uh, the folks that put this, this is wonderful program together for you today. Okay. And if I can help you, I will. And if not, I will guide you to, to, to folks that can help you. All right. But the, the small business development center has been around for a long time and they help people who want to grow businesses who are serious about businesses. Okay. And uh, Angela, if we have a, a couple of moments for some questions, all right, I'm here. Hi. Thank you so Hello. much for all of that uh, valuable information. If everyone out there can start populating any questions they might have for Raphael based off his presentation, just put them in the chat box and we'll keep checking on them as we're talking. Um, I wanted to mention, Raphael, some of the people that are here just so you know some of their mediums, we have a social impact visual artist, a glass artist, fine art photographer, sound composer, um, people that do sculpture, and there's a lot of people from South Florida and even outside of our area, some people from the Midwest, Great. Chicago. So it's a nice group of, of artists and creatives. Um, I wanna go to the first question I did see from Cheryl Brown. Um, she asked here, and I just put it up on the screen so we can read it. Um, is working on different ideas within a time frame okay? So she says, say focus on one idea for a month or so and then focus on another. And having several facets of a business often means handling more than one idea in the same time frame. So what do you think about uh, what she's asking here? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really great question. And uh, again, now you're getting into nuance of focus. Right, so when we're talking about focus, yeah, it's impossible in modern times to, to only focus on one thing. What we mean though is, is you have to pick the things, the 80-20 rule, you have to pick the things that are the most important, that if you don't get them done, everything falls away, right? So uh, sort of like if you don't pay your mortgage, you wind up not having a house to live in. So you gotta pay the mortgage, okay? So that's what we're talking about. But the idea of planning your time is very, very good, okay, Cheryl? So yes, you can focus on one thing for a month as long as you've given yourself that month. And what you want to do is, when I say focus, it's not just focus for focus sake. It's where do we move it to in that month? So in the beginning of the month, we were here. At the end of the month, we were there, then good. You did some focus, you got something done, okay? Then we move on to the next project, and that's fine, all right? But what you don't want to do is give yourself the excuse that because I'm working on 15 things, I don't get anything done, but boy, I had really good intentions, right? I, I really wanted to get a lot done, but I didn't get anything done because, you know, I had so much to get done. Point. No, 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 That's That's an excuse, okay? We don't want that, right? We, we want you getting things done. We want you working, uh, and we want you, think about it, um, an unfinished artwork doesn't help anybody. So if you can get it done in a month, just to get it done in a month. If you can get that theater project up in a month, yes. But if you have a show to do, you know, Hamilton, he had a certain amount of time to do it. He had to write it, had to script it, had to get, had to get it done. There's a lot of moving pieces, but the, the one idea, the one focus was get Hamilton on stage for opening night. Boom. Had to do that. Okay? So there's a lot of different pieces that go in. And remember, we can let other people help us with some of the other smaller pieces that surround it. Okay? Perfect. I hope that answers the question. Um. This is kind of more of a statement, but it's also a question at the same time. Um, forgive me if I'm saying your, wrong, your name incorrect, Michelle. She said, why did you choose engineering backgrounds to bring points about art? But she thought it was a very refreshing um, thing to do, especially about you know uh, the women that are the heads of the CEOs positions as well. Yeah, every, sure. every, everything that we, we, we're doing for you during this program has been well thought out, okay? And it's it's sort of like, when you're learning a new language, right? Your brain has to work harder when you're learning a new language. So if I speak to in the language that you know, color, music, theory, you know, history of music and art and stuff, your brains are gonna shut off because many of you are experts in that area. But if I hit you up with, with examples from a whole different, now, just so you know, science and art have more, uh, more in common than they do separate. 
Um, science, true science, is about creativity, innovation, and discovery. And just so you know, innovation is a word that belonged to you, the creative people. And you sort of let business people sort of now have, have taken that word. The true innovators have always been creative folks. Okay. Matter of fact, it was business people that went to the creative people for innovation and creativity. Innovation is just a fancy spin on creativity, creative process. Okay. Um, uh, people don't understand that creativity is a process, right? It is a process. And each of you have your own creative process, your own innovative strategies, but you're often not aware of it. So if we get you thinking about another discipline, how are you creative in law? How are you creative in engineering? How do we create an advanced mathematics? Okay. How do we discover a cure or a vaccine for this pandemic? Okay. That all takes creativity. And if artists don't know about creativity, then I don't know who does. But if we talk about art, you're not going to get there. Artists, an artist's brain gets challenged with the new, not, not with the already done. Okay? You're all about the new. You're all about the fresh. You're all about reinterpreting. All right? So that means you have to go. That's why I use Star Trek and Star Wars. Why? The undiscovered, right? To go where no artist has gone before. Okay? That's what we're talking about. Right when we when we use these examples, so I'm glad I'm, I'm glad you got something and you caught that 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 thing. Um, we have to be careful when we present to artists because you're usually very very sharp and you catch these things because your brain often many of you your brain is working on the right and left hemisphere at the same time, so you you absorb and you see different and that's what makes you such a great creative person, is that your brains are actually working differently and firing differently than than the rest of us normal human beings. So that's your superpower, okay? That's your that's your cape. That's what makes you fly. This makes you Wonder Woman or, or Batman. Again, I use Batman, Catwoman. You know, those those examples are there for a reason. You're superheroes, and those are your superpowers, right? So, thank you for that question. You know what you made me think of as you're saying that is how important it is to look at other industries when you are a creative person, and how that really just truly develops you. And you spoke about that through your out your entire presentation, um, but that's something that I overwhelmingly got from what you were speaking about. Um, how can artists or a creative person continually do that from he, from this point on when we leave this seminar? How do we continue to not be so stuck in our shell and to look outward at other industries? Well, well one is to get out of the shell, right? So, so often the journey of art is solitary. Mm -hmm. you're, you're writing music, you're painting, you're, you're, you're thinking about that next play. And you're there alone, or you're there with your team, and, and you're locked in a room, and you're working for months, you know. But um, again, I, I, I go to children, and, and beyond children, you know, go go to you know, become your dog, become your cat, become your parakeet. What I mean by that? When's the last time that you laid on the floor to feel how the floor feels? If you have a wooden floor, it feels different than a tile floor. It feels different than a rug or carpeting. Okay. When's the last time you laid in the grass and looked up at the sky? All right. So it's it's simple things that you can do in a physical realm, okay. And then for, for for creative people who have you know again their brains work at a different level, okay. To take yourself outside. So if, if you're a musician, why haven't you tried to draw? What does music look like visually? Because a musician should be able to explain explain that to us. And if you're a visual artist, what does color sound like? You see, so you have to constantly be challenging yourself. And, and if you get into a situation where you have become bored, then, then that's your fault. Because then you're not being your true creative self. You're not being who you are. You're not being the person you were born to be, which is the person that discovers the unique, different thing. Okay, Picasso sat down, all right, in a coffee shop, and he's talking to friends and stuff, and somebody asked him, hey, you know, what is this being an artist? And he said, I'll demonstrate what being an artist is. He went and there was a bicycle. He took the seat of the bicycle and took the handlebars, put the seat this way, put the handlebars on top, and he created a sculpture of a bull's head. He said, that's what being an artist is. Now, everybody at that coffee shop was looking at that bike and nobody saw a bull's head except Picasso. Now, think about looking at the world like that. That's the gift that you have. You have to help other people do that. And if you focus yourself not on yourself, the more you focus on yourself, the less you're able to do that. The more you focus on bringing your gifts to other people, how many other people can I get to see the bicycle 
as a bull. Let them feel like Picasso for one minute. You know how you've changed their life, especially if you've done it with a young person? Because they ne may never become a sculptor or a painter or a dancer, but they may become that person that solves cancer, okay, or that solves global warming, and it takes just as much creativity and innovation. So that seed that you planted, that seed of creativity grows in a different industry that we need, okay? So you must challenge yourself every day. That's the burden of your gift. You have this gift that other people don't have, so you have to take that gift and constantly be giving it. So if you focus outside of yourself, how does my gift help other people? That keeps you focused. It keeps that energy. It refreshes you every day. And, and you know, I didn't have time to get into this, but you all know you, you all know what you have to do. Eat more vegetables. Please drink water. Take care of yourself. The longer you live, the longer we have that gift of yours that you can share with us. All right? Because think about a world without color. Great. I don't want that world. I don't want my daughter growing up in that world. Think about a world without song. Without, without Think about our voices without intonality, intonation, and and just the subtlety, the, 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 you know, the difference between a flat note and a sharp note. I mean, the, you people that write music, you know that. I mean, you make us cry in a movie because you know this, because of the soundtrack, all right? What is the world without you? It's nothing. It's flat. It's great. It's soundless. There's no voice. There's no color. That's not living. That's not even surviving. That's just getting along. And we don't want that, okay? We need you. Like, you're vitally important. So if all it takes is for me to teach you a couple of business strategies and business techniques, I'm going to teach them to you all day. I want you to be as successful as possible. I want you to pay a lot of taxes because it means you're making a lot of money. And if you're making money, that means you are sharing that gift and changing people's lives. And that's what's important about this. So it's not about making the money. The money is how we keep score. Okay. And if you're going to play this game, that's how we keep score. All right. But you getting it out there, that's what's important. And that's how you keep your, your batteries charged. That's how you become the new artist every day when you wake up. And you wake up looking for that opportunity, looking for that opportunity for innovation, creativity, and to share. And to make us regular folks understand and feel what you feel all the time. It's not fair. It's not fair that you have it and others don't. Okay? I wish I could dance like the dancer, but I can't. All right? <clears throat> Thanks for the question, Angela. If I could have that pep talk on replay for myself every day, <laughs> I don't know what I would get done in life. <laughs> that was really great. I want to know also, um, David Rosenthal is asking a question here. I'll populate up. He's saying, is there a dollar amount threshold? Of, uh, I'm sorry. Is there a dollar amount a business needs to make before investing energy in an LLC or an S Corp or et cetera? Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Dave. Again, that's one of the nuanced questions you get from these creative folks, right? Because they're thinking at different levels. Okay, he said, "Well, you know, should I, should I?" But I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a, 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 an answer to that. That's gonna seem flippant at first, but I'll, I'll explain it. Okay, yeah, it's the one dollar level, right? Because if you're willing to invest one dollar, then you should put in the effort. Um, mm -hmm. Here's the thing: if you're gonna do it, you know, do it and do it full blown, hundred percent. But there is there is this concept that if you're making you know thirty forty thousand dollars a year or less, okay, um, you talk to your CPA about should I stay a sole proprietor because then you're operating almost more as a hobby, okay, a hobbyist that makes money and that's okay. That's one of the decision, decisions I want you to make. Some of you are phenomenal artists, but you don't have to sell seven million dollars worth of art every year. No, that's you don't have to bring it to that many people. If you're bringing it to just enough people, you know. 10, 20, 30 people a year, that's great. It's your choice, okay? Um, but if you're dealing, because we said we had a glass artist there, we have some people, you know, that are doing sculptures and things. Some of you really want to think about the liability side. If, you, if you're installing a sculpture, it falls on somebody, okay? Mm -hmm. You're working in glass, you have heat there, okay? Things like that, accidents happen. Yeah, you want that liability protection, okay? So that's, I want you thinking more about it that way than in terms of, you know, what the dollar amount is before I invest in it, okay? Because um, it only takes a couple hundred dollars in each state to become an LLC or a corporation anyway, okay? So that's not really the big issue. The big issue for you, Dave, and, and the rest of the folks that are out there is to talk with your CPA about, listen, how's this going to help me on my taxes? And what's the liability issues that I face with my art? You know, can somebody get hurt? Can I get sued? Those kind of things. So that's why we talked about entities in that way. All right, but that, that's a very good, again, a nuanced question. You see, I told you, Angela, these... Uh, creative folks are getting, getting good questions here going. Perfect. I have one more here. Um, 
This might be Mari or Mary. Sorry if I say your name incorrect. I have an LLC, but I've never taken full control of how I make my money, and I'm not sure how to charge people. And I chronically undercharge and have suffered greatly as a result. I'm sure a lot of creative people can definitely relate to that as well. Yeah, the reason the reason that that, that um, I, I choose to be so very passionate and and what you call motivating um, <clears throat> and while I appreciate that. I believe that we motivate ourselves. Now I can share passion with you and hopefully that, that like this virus, it spreads and, and that passion goes to you and, and, and it inflames your passion, right? But what, what, uh, what Mari is saying here is very, 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 very important. We see this across the board and, and, and again, I have a daughter, I was raised, raised by women, okay? So we see this, um, <clears throat> and this has been proven out by science. Uh, People who are incompetent or not good at things often believe they're great at them. And people who are good at things, especially women, consistently doubt themselves. And creative folks are consistently doubting themselves. And this is where that undercharging comes from. The best way to handle this is, <clears throat> again, it's the same formula. Stop thinking about yourself. Take yourself off the plate. This is somebody that you love or you're mentoring a young artist. And they create work just like yours, the same quality level. What would you be telling them to charge? I often find that you as artists give great advice to other up and coming artists and you don't follow your own advice, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to pricing and things like that. At minimum, you should be taking into account the time it took you, the materials and their cost because you're using high quality materials. Okay. And then you have to give yourself an hourly rate. And you're a professional. So you're talking about 35, 45, 55, 125, 395, whatever it is an hour. Okay. Remember, it's taking you a lifetime to learn how to do what you do. And if it was easy, everybody would do it. So if you're having a hard time pricing, then stop pricing your stuff and let somebody else price it for you. That's all. Ask somebody that you know that's that's a cold business person. Say, hey, listen, what should I be charging? Let's say you charge $100 a piece. They might come and say, that's worth $1,000. You know, like, what? Yeah, let them price it. And 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 ask three people. You know, if this was in a, in, in a store or something and you saw it, let's say you do sculpture or whatever, whatever it is you're doing, how much you spend? Oh, I bought something like that last week and I paid $1,500 for it. What? I'm selling this on my site, you know, for Etsy for $100 or $50. Yeah, you're missing out on, you know, $1,450. <laughs> Okay, so again, once you detach it from yourself, remember that once the art is born, it is very much like a child. It's its own entity, right? It's its own thing. It has to have its own life. Okay, so don't undervalue that. The same way you would not undervalue your child, okay? So when you create something, that thing does have value. But take it away from yourself. Let your friends and family and people that you respect, your CPA, your accountant, let them tell you how much, you know, it, it's worth. How much, you know, the, the, and, and just, you know, absorb that information because that's all it is, is information. Okay. And that's one of the most successful ways that we see that quickly changes people away in that undervalue concept. That's a, that's a very common theme. Okay. Uh, is the undervaluing. Don't do it. Don't do it. And whatever price you choose usually won't be high enough anyway. So <laughs> right, but good, another good question. You know, you know, that makes me also think about what you're saying leading into when you showed the water bottle example mm -hmm. and the coffee, and then you said, would you pay this price? And then right. that led into the branding, which equals quality and how people are willing to pay for that. So even speaking on that greater, how can people find their own quality in their work? I think you're saying to reach out to other people to really um, access that information if you can't do it yourself. Yeah, the, but the other thing is is that that's not also a personal commitment. Okay, you have to put in the work. You have to put in the time. You know what you know what materials you're using. You know how long it takes you. You know you have to. The quality comes from you, and your dedication and your seriousness in the creative process. If you're throwing it together, then don't expect real people to spend real money on something that you threw together. Okay, if you're just, you know, just getting it done, no, all right? Put in a, and I know what you're gonna say, some of you say, yeah, but there are people making a lot of money throwing it together. Yeah, that's okay. There's a lot of stuff happening in the world that doesn't involve us. 
Okay, there are people that lie that become successful. That's fine. That's them. That we're not. That, that's not us. Um, uh, many of the things that we talked about today is like the Force, right? In Star Wars, you want to be a Jedi, you want to be a Sith. That's what it's about. Okay, you want to be on the right side of things or not? How do you want to use your gift and your energy? So that that's what you do. So you know you put the time in. You know you put the quality in. Then you you feel comfortable about asking for that quality price. Okay. <clears throat> Remember that art has always been a luxury. If not, then we call it craft. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with craft. I love craft. Okay, but that really is art has been a luxury for, for many, 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 many years, okay, throughout human history. All right. So you have to understand that. Not everybody's gonna be able to afford your art, but the people that do afford it provide the funds so that you can share it with people that can't afford it. So you always do that. And you let the people that do afford it know that you're sharing with people that can't afford it on their behalf. And that makes them feel better. It doesn't only make them be able to experience your art, but they also know that they're sharing their experience with other people who don't have the capacity, okay, right now to share in that experience, okay? But you definitely, you know, quality is an issue that you really, really always have to be focused on, and you have to be putting in the time and putting in the work so that people understand it and they sense that quality. When you're in the presence of art, it does something to you. And so there's not only quality of materials, manufacturing, those kind of things like that. There's quality in production. There's quality in experience, okay? The difference between somebody that plays a guitar chord that has 20 years of experience playing that chord and me, who might just be learning today, there's a different experience even though I'm hitting the same tone, even though I'm hitting the same chord. There's just a difference in that experience. And that is the quality. All right, BB King when he played the blues is not the same thing as Rafael Cruz playing the blues. Okay, and it, those of you that know music understand what I'm talking about. All right, one note from BB and that's all you need, <laughs> and that's a lifetime of quality. There, so quality is not only in materials; it's an experience also. Okay. And one more question I want to ask: um, I love how you spoke about using your competition, so to say, to your advantage, and especially now where we're all sort of separated, but we still want to come together. I think that is a really wonderful example. What do you think could be some solutions right now for artists to continue to find what would be their so-called competition and come together to really be successful, especially right now? Well, it's interesting if you study the history of art, right? And uh, let's study just the impressionist period, okay? Uh, yeah, I know the history of art, okay? <laughs> So I'm a ringer. That's why Jim brings me into these and Madeline and people like that. Uh, but if you study the Impressionist period, you'll, you'll find if you study any of the autobiographies of the great Impressionists, they all know each other. So while they were friends, they were also, quote, unquote, competitive rivals. And that friendly, okay, familial, okay, competition is what drove them all to keep raising the game, raising their level. So when I say competition, your competition are the artists around you who are creating. And when you see their work, you say, wow, wow, you know, Angela just took this to a new level. I have to go back to the studio. That's what I mean by competition. It's, it's not somebody that, you know, you're trying to win against. No, um, you know, it's, it's somebody that because of the great things that they're doing, they challenge you to take your music, your art, your creativity to that next level for you, okay? So your competition, you could be having a salon every week with your artist friends, all right? So you're not outside in Paris drinking coffee, but you're in home on Zoom and you're having an artist salon and you, you pick a theme. You wanna make it fun? Here's an idea. Pick some famous people in engineering, find out what's creative about them and share that at the salon. So now what you've done is you've, you're talking to different artists and your friends who are competitive, right? But you also bring it into another industry. So you have to think differently. You have to change the way you think about it. And you're looking for something specific. How were they creative in their career? So just with that little idea, we've created, we went back to history. We learned from what? We learned from the people that did it best, right? From the impressionists. We took what they did. They used to drink so much coffee, okay? And they smoked a lot of cigarettes too. We don't want to do that, okay? On coffee, that's fine, okay? But you drink some water too. But the idea is to get together and have those deep conversations and challenge each other and get into those, you know, not arguments, but competitive discussions about, hey, do you really think that? No, come on, not really. And at the end of it, we're still 
brothers and sisters in creativity. All right. So that's how we use competition. That's how that's the best way to use it. Okay. You get in the ring with somebody that's better than you, but you have padding on. Okay. Nobody wants to get hurt. All right. But we still take a couple of shots so that we learn how to how to defend ourselves a little better. All right. The best competition is your friends because they, they help you raise your game. All right. If you're a basketball player, you know when they when they got by you and they get that they get that two points on you, you learn how to block that or you want to learn that move yourself. And that's how the game keeps getting better and better. All right. So that's how you use competition. That's the fun way. That's that's the good way because you want them to be friends. At the end of the day, you both uh, you're all competing at a high level. And remember, same way there's room for Rolls Royce and Bentley and everybody, there's room for everybody. Okay, there's room for everybody. So, and you'll be successful in your own way. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Raphael, for all of your knowledge and your expertise. I know that you've pumped everybody up. And it's so early. So if we can be pumped up now, we can be pumped up for the whole weekend and continue to be creative. And you've really inspired a lot of people. Um, and I know people want to continue to stay connected with you. So make sure to stay connected with Raphael Cruz. Um, what's the best way to continue to stay connected with you? Well, I gave my email there. That's that's the easiest easiest way. Now, don't bombard me because I, I work, you know, um, with, with tons of businesses and, and things like that. So if you don't hear from me from a little while, don't, don't worry. You can send me an email. Don't, don't take it personally. But I will tell you, please stay on for the next one. Um, I can't tell you the knowledge you're going to get from I, – I, I, I learned yesterday just in the practice so much, and we breezed through her slides. Serona is phenomenal. She's a phenomenal legal mind. I mean, you're just going to be it, – it, it's it's just being able to learn from her and the things that she's going to talk about that are so important, protecting your rights, all right? Again, when we get serious about these things, we have to be serious about these things, okay? Um, and, and I'll end with this, okay, just so you know. Uh, for, for all of you folks, uh, I am one of you. That's why I'm just as crazy as you are. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Jim and Madeline know this. Many people in, in my business life don't know this, but before I went to business school and before I owned businesses and ran things and did all that stuff, I went to art school. So I am I am an artist. I was born an artist. I continue to call myself an artist, uh, and I live as an artist. And, it, and it's that artistic side of me that actually made me very successful in business. People didn't understand how my brain worked. And I used to tell them all the time, I said, you're not going to understand because you're not one of us. You know, you don't have that type of thing that we have, right? So I'm, I'm one of you. That's why I understand you, okay? But I learned how to be a business person also, so you can do it too. It's, it's not that hard. All right, so thank you for a lot of the, the positive comments that are being sent out there. I really appreciate it. But stay on. Take your break. Stay on, Angela. Thank you. And Madeline uh, and Angela to your team, thank you for making this easy for me to get done. Okay, I've had a lot of fun. Again, we're on a Saturday morning talking about boring business, so let's make it fun. <laughs> all right, folks. So, uh, thank you to all of you in the comments and everything. All right, and, and have a good rest of the day. Uh, it, it was my wife's birthday yesterday, but we're celebrating it today. So uh, as soon as I'm done, uh, the rest of the day is, is, is for my wife and my daughter. All right, That's so you all have a great one. Please stay safe and stay healthy. Thank right? you. And continue creating. You right? Thank you very much. All right, bye-bye. Wow, that was a really good session. And I know just like all of you, I was feverishly writing down notes. And you're going to want to continue doing that because first, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back on at 1045. And we are going to be speaking to Serona about protecting your rights. So refill your coffees and meet us back here at 1045.
everybody. Welcome back. We are in the second half of our presentation today. You are here at the Business Skills for the Modern Creator presented by the Broward County Cultural Division and hosted by us, Team Archive. Uh, we had our first session so far, which was on creating a business plan. And now we are very excited to bring you our second speaker today. Sirona Elton is speaking about protecting your rights. So let me tell you a little bit about Sirona before we bring her on. Sirona has extensive experience as a music industry professional and educator. She is a professor, the Associate Dean of Administration, and Director of the Music, Business, and Entertainment Industries Program at the University of Miami Frost School of Music. She is also currently the head of educational partnerships for the Mechanical Licensing, Licensing Collective. She has worked for major music companies such as Warner Music Group, Sony Music Entertainment, Universal Music Group, and EMI Recorded Music. Her areas of expertise include mechanical licensing, royalties, contract summarization and management, rights management, record company operations, and music industry information management. She has held leadership roles in the Music and Entertainment Industry Educators Association, the Copyright Society of the USA, and the Recording Academy Florida Chapter Board of Governors. She is currently the immediate past chair of the Florida Bar Entertainment Arts and Sports Law Section, and is a licensed attorney in New York and Florida. She has appeared in numerous NPR marketplace shows, commenting on biz music business topics and recently provided insight on music streaming to CNN. And she is frequently a guest speaker at music business and copyright conferences and has authored numerous journal articles and book chapters. So one thing I wanna make mention to Serona being such a wealth of knowledge for protecting your rights, but due to the very sensitive and what is project matter, we will not be taking any questions at the end like we normally do. And also remember, this is a live broadcast that is being recorded, so please restrain from putting any type of personal information into the chat box. But just so you know, we will have a link for you to re access resources after she speaks, so you can go back and take a look on your own. So, without further ado, I'd like to remove myself and let Serona take it away. Good morning, good morning. Wow, Raphael was so amazing. It's gonna be really difficult to follow that. Um, let me get myself positioned right here with these slides. There we go, okay. Um, so, good morning, everybody. It is a, an honor to be here. Um, I'm such a fan of this program, and um, it's it's amazing that they're still making this happen despite the fact that mo you know we're attending from home. So, so it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to share a lot of information with you this morning, um, but I want you to know that everything that's on my slides you're going to have access to after this session. So don't feel like you have to write down everything from the slides if you're trying to take notes. You will have them afterwards, um, so don't worry about that. Um, and at the end, we'll, we'll make sure you know how to get in touch with an art lawyer um, or a music lawyer if you need one um, to talk about your specific questions. All right, so let's get started. So the way today's session is going to break down, we're going to first start talking about establishing your rights to your intellectual property and talk about the basics of how intellectual property works. We'll talk about creative works that are protected by copyright. We'll talk about your name, your company name that are protected by trademark. And we'll talk a little bit about your inventions and how they would be protected by patent law. And then we're going to shift and focus on how you can grant other people permission to use your intellectual property. Um, and that's really the key to monetizing uh, your property. All right, so let's get started. Next slide. Okay, so what is copyright? What is copyright? Number one question I think I get asked. So it's a form of property ownership. You already know what property ownership is. You, you own your cell phone. You own your computer. Um, you might own real property like 
you know, your home perhaps or land. Um, but it's a form of property that we call intellectual property. Um, and so you can't touch it and feel it. Um, it doesn't exist in physical form, although it might be that that creative work is embodied in something. So if you imagine you have a book and you own a book, um, I've got books on my bookshelf. And so those are physical versions that embody the intellectual property that is that work of, of authorship, that textual work, that story. So that's what copyright is. And copyright protects different kinds of artistic and creative works. Okay, next slide. So what exactly does it mean to own a copyright, especially if you can't touch it and feel it? What does that mean? It means that the law gives you, you specifically, a set of exclusive rights over the use of your work. Essentially, it's control. You have control over your work if you own the copyright. And so the copyright law actually lays out very specific rights. It's very, very specific. They are the right to reproduce the work, to make copies of it, to distribute that work, make it available for other people, to adapt it. Maybe you're going to change your written story into um, a story for film, let's say, to publicly perform it. So, you know, this is a little different, by the way, we'll talk about some music nuances. Not every kind of work under the copyright law is protected in exactly the same way. But a public performance is, you know, if you put on an art show, let's say, or you have your music played on the radio, those are public performances. Um, uh, actually, public display would be more appropriate for an art show. Um, public performance, public display. So those are the rights that the copyright law gives you very specifically. Um, and we're going to talk a lot more about these. Okay, next slide. So what exactly can be protected by copyright? What exactly? So this is a little dry language, I warn you, it's straight out of the copyright law, but we can do this together, all right? Original works of authorship fixed in any tangible medium of expression now or later developed from which they can be perceived, reproduced, or otherwise communicated either directly or with the aid of a machine or device. So let me now tell you what that means in plain English, right? Let's break it down, let's translate it. So it's an original work of authorship. So it's something that you created from scratch, didn't borrow somebody else's work. You created it from scratch, it's original. And you have to have it fixed. It can't just exist in your mind. There's no way for the law to protect something that only exists in your mind. It has to get out of your mind and into something. Now, that could be that if it's a, if it's a song, you've made a recording of it. Or if it's a story, you've typed it or you hand wrote it. Or you dictated it by you know, speaking into a recorder. Or you know, it, it has to come out of your brain has to go from your brain into a recording or a writing or a photograph. It has to be something that others can perceive, right? If you imagine if you're sending in materials to the copyright office to register your claim of copyright, you can't just sort of say, I have this idea in my mind. <laughs> you have to send them something, right? Some sort of fixation that embodies your creation. So that's what all that legalese means. Basically, it's an original work of authorship that has been fixed into some tangible form of expression. Okay. So what can be protected by copyright? Not everything can be protected by copyright. Some things are not protectable at all. Some things fall under trademark or patent law. So what can be protected? So, so firstly, there's no subjective judgment involved. It's not based on the aesthetics. It could be the worst song ever written and it could still be protected. It could be the ugliest piece of art still protected. There's absolutely no, um, no subjective judgment that says, is this good enough to get protected? That's not part of the analysis at all. What it has to be is independently created so you have to create it on your own. You cannot copy it from somebody else, hence the term copyright, right? Um, you cannot have copied it from somebody else. It has to be original. And just like it doesn't have to be, you know, really good or even a little bit good, um, it doesn't have to be the first time anyone's ever done it either. When we talk a little bit later about patents, um, in order to get a patent, um, that thing you've invented has to be something no one else has invented before. But if I'm, let's say, copywriting, you know, um, 
a, a song about love or a drawing that shows a mother holding a child. You know, those may not be original concepts and that's fine. It does not have to be um, conceptually novel, novel meaning new, to be protected by copyright. It just has to be original, meaning you can't have copied it from somebody else. Okay, next slide. So what kinds of works can be protected? Okay, so this list didn't come from my brain. This came straight out of the copyright law. So let's run down the list. Literary works, so stories, poems, for example, fall into that. Musical works, so these are songs or compositions um, that you, you know, if you can imagine, they're the kind of thing you would put down on sheet music. Think of musical notes. <clears throat> and that includes the lyrics. Dramatic works. So these are plays, for example, musicals, things like that. Um, pantomimes or choreographic works. Dance can be protected by copyright. A choreography to a dance routine can be protected by copyright. Um, pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works. Photographs, drawings, um, sculptures that get created, all of that is protectable. Motion pictures or other audiovisual works, so video, to say that very simply. Um, sound recordings. So these are now recordings capturing sound. And that might be that you're capturing um, a song, right? So a song, musicians play the song, you capture it, now you've got a recording. It could be a speech. So somebody could be giving a speech and you make a recording of that. And that recording itself is a copyrightable work. And it kind of embodies within it the underlying textual work of that speech. Um, or it could be you know, sound effects. Sometimes those could be protected as sound recordings. And then lastly, architectural works. So, you know, the plans that architects create, architectural works are also protected by copyright. So what cannot be protected by copyright? So inventions, discoveries, processes, systems, and product designs. I have an idea to create a new such and such, a new mask, a new style of mask. Right? Maybe you've come up with a really cool new style, a whole new shape of mask, not like anything anybody's ever done. That would be something that you would look into getting a patent to protect. Um, names, symbols, or combination of those. So brand names, company names, um, those kinds of things that are used to identify products or services and to distinguish them from one another, right? The point of those is not to be, you know, creatively. Uh, it's not a creative work. It's really about actually brand recognition and differentiating one business from another so that consumers know um, their source of goods, like where did this come from? That is protected by trademark. Um, and any business information that's kept secret and given a business competitive advantage, like that secret formula sometimes to something that um, a company may decide not to patent um, because patents eventually run out. I, the most you know famous secret, um, trade secret is, and I, I might touch on this later, is the formula of Coca-Cola, for example. So there are things that you protect by trade secret. Um, and essentially, the, the few people you let know about it, you have them sign a contract to agree they have to keep it confidential. Um, and then ideas and concepts, just stuff that's in your head. Um, and ideas and concepts that then can get manifested in lots of different ways. Those are not protectable. So for example, you think of the story of um, Romeo and Juliet um, and forget the fact that Shakespeare wrote it a zillion years ago. The idea that there's these two young people, they're in love with each other, their families are not supportive. You know, it's very like angsty, right? Um, that's not protectable. Um, Creating a song, hear me. Okay, I'm back. Okay, I didn't, oh, and it's in and out. All right, I'm still here. Um, those ideas, those concepts, you can't protect that. So, you know, if you say, I have an idea for a movie and, you know, what's going to happen is um, this person is like the protagonist and this person is the antagonist, blah, blah, blah. You can't protect that idea. Ideas are not protectable. Okay, next slide. And forgive me if you hear my cats meowing in the background. If you've ever had Siamese cats, they refuse to be silenced. So uh, we'll just ignore them. They're fine. 
Okay, so um, intellectual property, as I mentioned, it cannot be possessed. You can't hold the intellectual property. Um, you can own it, you can have those rights. Um, and then you can possess a particular performance or embodiment of it. Again, I can have a book and that book is the embodiment of a literary work. So I, as the person who bought the book, I own the book, but I don't own any rights at all in that literary work. That's going to be between the author and the book publisher. Got nothing to do with me as a person that bought the book. Um, so that's different kind of ownership, right? I bought movies. I've got DVDs. I've bought downloads on Amazon. I don't own the underlying audiovisual work, just like, you know, the recordings you have, this music, you don't own that. Okay, so possession of that embodiment does not give you any rights to the underlying copyright that are that's in that embodiment. Okay, next slide. So how do you become a copyright owner? Is it difficult? Is it complicated? It's so easy. It's so easy. People confuse this. It is so easy. You are the owner of your copyright as soon as you create that work and fix it in some form. So like I could do something right now where you could watch copyright ownership be created right now. I could sit here with a pen and I could write a poem about how much I love Saturday mornings. And bam, you just watched copyright ownership happen just like that. That's all it takes to own the copyright is to get it out of your brain and fix it. I own the copyright in that little poem I just wrote right then about Saturday mornings. Okay, my little fake poem didn't have enough substantive work to, to warrant protection, but you get the point. So um, there's one exception to this, one exception to this, and that is if you have already agreed before you started creating, you've agreed before you started creating at all, that this thing you're about to create is not gonna be owned by you. We call that something a work made for hire. And so let's pretend that you work at a magazine and your job is to create amazing layouts for pages, you know, the art that's gonna go in the pages of a magazine and that's your day job, that's your full-time job. Um, you already agreed as a term of your employment that that stuff you create, those amazing layouts, you don't own that work. The magazine owns that work. Um, it might also be the case that you are hired to create, you're not an employee, but you're an independent contractor and you're hired to create a certain kind of creative work. Um, and this is actually what happens usually when a record company signs a recording artist, they're hiring that artist as an independent contractor to go in the studio and make a recording of musical works. In that case, the employer, the record company owns the copyright in that recording. So it, you wouldn't know, you would know it though. It doesn't happen by accident. You know it, it's either part of your employment, you know, your, your employer has hired you to create works, or you've done something that you've signed in writing before you ever started creating, agreeing that this thing you're about to create is a work made for hire. Um, if you haven't done that, then as soon as you create something, you own the copyright. You do. Copyright registration is different than copyright ownership. It's different. This is the thing people confuse. Copyright registration is an option, an option. It's not required. It's an option that you have to register your claim of ownership with the U.S. Copyright Office. It's like you're going on record and kind of essentially putting everybody on notice. Hey, uh, I own this just so you all know. OK, that's what you're doing when you register something with copyright. So people sometimes are worried. They're like, I wrote this thing last week. I haven't registered yet. Oh my gosh. Like, you know, anybody could just use it. No, they can't. As soon as you created it, it was protected. As soon as you created it, it was protected. Copyright registration can happens after that. It can happen really quickly after that. It can happen a long time after that. There are benefits to, to registering your copyright claim sooner than later, but you don't need to register your claim to be the owner. You were the owner the minute you created the work. Okay. Next slide. So why should you register? Like, if that's true, Serona, if I owned it, as soon as I created it, why should I register? Like, why then? Why? Okay, this is why. If somebody then later infringes your work, so they copy, they've copied it, they right, remember that list? They've reproduced it, they distributed it, they adapted it, they performed it, right? That list of things that are your exclusive rights. 
If somebody did one of those things without your permission, then we say they're infringing on your rights. So if somebody infringes on your copyright in order to sue them in court, you have to have registered your copyright. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't register it after you find out that someone's infringed it, right? So let's say on Monday, you created a song in the studio, a song and you made a recording. On Wednesday, somebody else who was in the room next door overheard it and made their own version and puts it up on Spotify. On Thursday, you go talk to a lawyer and you're like, absolutely, we need to sue this person. On Friday, you could register the copyright. You could do it on an expedited basis. It'll cost you a little more money. So it has to really be worth it. But you could register it on Friday. You could pay the extra money, get that registration filed, and then sue them when the registration comes back. So it's you can still file a suit. Sorry, you can still file a registration after someone's infringed your work that you never registered. It's not ideal. It's not the best way to go. But it's not an absolute block that says, wow, somebody's infringed my copyright and I didn't register it. I have no options. That's not true. So the reason you want to register is you have to have registered in order to sue somebody for infringing you. And if you register, if you register within a particular amount of time from when it was created or for when you first made it available to people to, you know, you made it available to sort of to the public, they could buy it, they could enjoy it. Um, then you get an extra perk. And when you sue someone, you are asking for something called damages. That's that's the money you ask for in a lawsuit. When you're like, judge, I want you to make this person pay me X amount of money. We call that damages. And if you've registered your work in a timely manner, you get to ask for something called statutory damages. And that's different than normal damages, which are about compensating you for the amount of money you've lost. So let's use that example of music, right? My little example there on Thursday, right, of my little scenario week, we were imagining that that um, other musician that, that infringed your work put it up on Spotify. And let's just pretend that by the time you sue them, they made $100 on Spotify. And you're sitting there going, well, $100, like that's okay. So you could ask the court for that $100, like that $100 should be mine. But if you have statutory damages, they can often be a lot more than how much money you actually lost. They can be up to $150,000 per infringement, even if the money actually involved was only a small amount of money. So this comes into play a lot when you have people illegally sharing your content for free. You can't, you know, you can't say, look, all that money changed hands. It should be mine. They're going to go, hey, nobody changed any money. There was no money that exchanged. I gave them a copy. They gave their friend a copy. They gave their friend a copy. Well, guess what? You can still sue them and ask for statutory damages, which is $150,000. Um, even if all that copyright infringement happened without any dollars changing hands. So um, it's a strong incentive to register early rather than later. Um, and it also recognizes that copyright infringement can create damages without having actual money change hands by the infringers. Okay, next slide. I'm gonna take a quick swig of water. All right, so when should you register? It's cheapest, costs you the least amount of money with the Copyright Office to register before it's published. Now, let me be clear about what I mean by published. The copyright law doesn't mean so you have found a publisher, a book publisher, a music publisher, an art publisher. It, that's not what published means. Published means made available to the public. Like it's out there, it's reproduced and distributed. It's put out to the public. That's what's mean by publication in a copyright law sense. Um, so in order to get those statutory damages, you need to register your works with the Copyright Office no later than three months after first publication or at least before any infringement begins. So there's a really strong incentive to register your works within at least three months of um, publication. And, you know, often like sooner than that, the sooner the better. That way, if somebody infringes your work after that date and you have to sue them, you have this option of statutory damages. Doesn't mean you have no options. You can ask for actual damages, but statutory damages is a pretty compelling option. So that's why you should register within that time period. Next slide. How do you register? Do you need a lawyer? No, 
You don't need a lawyer for copyright registration. You do not need a lawyer to do this. So it's really easy. You do it online. You can go to copyright.gov slash registration. Um, it's the fastest way. You can still mail some things in, but those take a lot longer. They, the Copyright Office really has modernized their systems. They want you to do this um, online. And let's say you've done a sculptural work or a piece of art that you're like, how am I supposed to get that to the Copyright Office? It's, it's a mural. It's, you know, it's a huge statue. You can take pictures and upload them pictures. You don't have to actually send them a copy of the sculpture. <clears throat> um, so you do this online, upload a copy of your work. Um, the price ranges between $40 to $85, um, depending on the way you are registering, whether it's one work or a collection of works. I'll talk about which is cheaper in a minute. Um, and you do not need a lawyer. On the Copyright Office website, there's lots of great instructions um, because the goal is for any creator to be able to register their copyright protection. It's, it's not meant to be difficult and it's gotten easier and easier with like helpful videos. Um, you do not need a lawyer for this. So how do you save money on registration? So what you can do is you can take a bundle of unpublished works and register that as a collection. So if you imagine, and, and forgive me, I know a lot of you are not musicians, but um, I'm just gonna use music because it's an easy frame of reference that pretty much everybody kind of understands because we all enjoy music in our lives. Let's say you're a songwriter and let's say you are cranking out a song a day. You're like, I've been doing this now. Last year, I had 365 songs that I wrote. Are you telling me, Serona, that I got to pay $40 times 365? Like, where am I supposed to get that kind of money? So here's the good answer. You don't have to register it that way. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. What you could do is you could say, you know what? If these conditions are met, um, I'm going to bundle up my songs from 2019 and I'm going to register that as a collection of Serona's songs for 2019, all 365 of them as one collection. And I'm going to register that whole collection and pay that fee once. Look at that savings, right? But understand there's certain conditions that have to be met for you to do that. So here's the conditions. First step, um, you have to have it all organized. Like it can't be just like a mess, right? A spreadsheet of your song titles, that's fine, has to be organized, okay? That's not a hard, that's not hard, hard to do. Um, the combina combined elements need to bear a single title. So Serona songs collect, you know, songs of 19, uh, songs of 2019. There you go, there's my collection name. That was not hard. Copyright claimant has to, um, the copyright claimant or claimants for each element are the same. So here's where it gets tricky, right? If I wrote all these songs myself, I'm the one claimant, easy peasy. But let's say I wrote half of those with another person. Let's say Raphael and I wrote half of those, right? Or not even half. Let's say out of the 365, Raphael and I wrote 30. So what would happen is I cannot register all 365 as this collection because 30 of them have different different claimant than me alone. So what I would do is I would register the 30 with Raphael because just the two, two of us wrote all that 30. We would register that together. Um, and then I would register the other 335 um, as my, my collection from 2019 where I was the sole author. So when you collaborate with others, um, every Every work in that collection that you want to register as one collection has to have all the same claimants. Um, so you may have to slice and dice it a bit into batches um, with the other people you've collaborated with. Okay, go ahead. There's one more condition. Um, so all, all the elements are by the same author. Um, so actually, let me let me contrast this with the the point on the third, the point number three on the prior slide. So point number three is actually about claimant. Now, for most of you that are doing your own creative works, you are both the author and the claimant. You're both. Um, but if you are a company, let's say a music publisher, um, if you are a company, then you may be claiming that work, or let's say you're a magazine, right? You're claiming that work. Um, and that's different than being the author. So if I'm a music publisher, I'm the claimant and the works may be authored by many, many different songwriters. 
So from the, the um, condition number three on the prior page, the claimants all have to be the same to register it. Copyright owners, however, the, the authors in this case, if you've got multiple authors, so long as one author runs through all of it, you can register it as a work. So let, let me redo my let me redo my example with Raphael, because I think I've made this more confusing than it needs to be. I probably need another cup of coffee. Let's let's redo that. Let's do redo that scenario. So let's pretend for um for criteria number three, criteria number three that I'm a music publisher and I am putting out um, um, a best love songs songbook. okay? I'm gonna put out a bunch of these best, long, best love songs. It's gonna be a collection and they're all written by different people. Um, they're all written by different people, but, but I'm the claimant in the whole thing. And um, there's one author who wrote at least a piece of every song under there. Like they wrote all these songs with lots of different people, but Serona was at least a co-writer on every single song in this collection. She was a, an author on every single song in this collection. It can all be registered in this one bundle to save money. Um, the way you see this most often in commerce for um, you know companies is an album, think of a typical album, take your favorite album, that usually gets registered as one album with the Copyright Office, uh, as opposed to individual sound recordings. And it's usually the record company that registers that. Um, so if you are doing it yourself, you are your own creator, you're not working with a company that is handling your copyrights or that owns the copyrights, which is probably true for a lot of you on this on this um, session, then as long as you have created at least every, every single one in the work, in the collection you have created, you are one of the co-authors, you can do it this way. You can do it this way. Sorry if I made that sound a bit more confusing. You're gonna get these slides and you can go back and reread them. And there's great information about this on the Copyright Office website as well. Um, so when you do this, you can actually register the entire collection for under $100. So contrast, you know, those 365 songs I wrote at $40 a pop with registering all of them for under $100 a pop. So it makes complete sense. This is especially important for photographers. Um, when you think about it, you know, a songwriter probably won't crank out a lot more than one song a day. Most of them, even that's pretty prolific. A photographer could be taking hundreds of photographs a day. Just think about that. Um, and so um, there's no limit on the number that you can do this way. It just all has to be under one collection and neatly organized. Um, but literally, you could do 100, 100 photos a day times 365 days and register the whole batch as a collection and still save money and register for $100. Okay, so the symbol, you see the symbol, the little C in a circle. So um, you do not need to register your work in order to use the C. You can use that C no matter what. And it's optional. A long time ago, long time ago, if you did not have the C on an embodiment of your work, so for example, sheet music, if it was published without the C on there, um, you would lose your protection. Can you imagine that? Um, but years ago, we did away with that requirement. And so it is not mandatory that you use the C in a circle symbol. And you do not have to have registered your work in order to use the C in a circle. You can just use it. It's no problem. Um, it's actually a good idea because usually what it kind of says is, hey, I'm aware of copyright. And what follows it is the year of the creation and who, who owns the copyright. And so let's say somebody else sees your artwork somewhere, they'll know that this was created in 2020 and that it was created by Serona Elton. And maybe the person looking at your work says, oh my gosh, I love this work. I want to find out more about this, you know, this person. Let me look up their name. Let me find out what other works they've done. Um, so having that copyright information is often a great, you know, marketing thing, frankly. Um, it helps people know if they're trying to find out more where to go. Um, but you do not have to use the C in a circle and you do not have to register in order to use it. Okay, next slide. So we touched upon work made for hire a while back. 
work made for hire. So in this situation, the author is not the initial owner. Remember, I wrote my little pretend poem and you, you watched copyright ownership happen right there in front of your eyes. Well, there's, a, there's an exception to when that happens. And that's where the author is not going to be the initial owner. The party that has hired them, their employer, that party that has hired them as a, as a contractor, they're creating a commissioned work. I'm hiring you to create this thing for me. Ooh, my lighting just went out. <laughs> um, the, the party that um, has hired them, they are going to be actually the initial owner. So um, this happens a lot in a variety of scenarios. Here we go. We got lighting back. All right. There we go. Um, the This happens in record company perspectives. This happens in um, artwork for magazines, for example, where somebody is hiring a creative person to create something for them. And it's a work made for hire, which means that the party hiring you is going to be the initial owner, not the author, not the author. And the person that created the work, they only have whatever rights have been established in a contract with that owner. Um, so if someone's hiring you to create something for them, you need to have something written up that makes it clear, a document, at least an email, something that captures exactly what you're doing for them and, and what your rights are into that work. And a lot of the times you may be limited from using that work for anything other than just to show your own portfolio. Um, so in a, in a music context, uh, a recording artist signed to a typical recording company record deal, they can't tell you, sure, you can make copies of my record. They can't tell you that because they don't control the rights that way. The record company is the only one that can authorize somebody to make copies of that record. Um, but the recording artist gets paid money um, and may have say so in certain activities like they, they may need to, um, they may limit the record company to get their permission before that music could be used in a movie, for example. But all of that is because they've negotiated that in their contract, not because copyright law gave them the right to control that. So in a work made for hire situation, if you are the author, you do not control the copyright. You only have the kind of control that is outlined in a contract you have with the party that has hired you to make the work. Okay, next slide. Fair use. This is a concept can be confusing. Um, and people ask me questions about this all the time. And usually one of the biggest things that trips them up is that word fair that, well, that seems fair to me. Seems fair. That's not the standard. It's not that gut feel about does it feel fair? The law is very specific about what a fair use is. However, as specific as it is, it's actually not as, 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 it's not as specific as we would like. Um, so, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Fair use is not a right. Fair use is a defense to copyright infringement. For example, you don't say, well, yeah, it was my right to use it that way. It was a fair use. What happens is somebody says, hey, you used my work. You copied it. You didn't have my permission. That was an infringement. And your defense is, yes, I did copy your work. Yes, I did not get your permission. That's right. But my use was a fair use. See the difference? It's a defense. It's a defense. And so some uses are considered fair. And therefore, it was okay that you copied and you did not get permission. So the copyright law outlines some examples of this. Criticism. So let's say I am writing a newspaper review um, or an online review of someone's work. And I want to say, you know, these lyrics in this song were terrible. And so let me let me share some of those with you, for example. Right. That would be an example of criticism. It doesn't have to be negative criticism. I could say this is the most amazing, the inspiring text I've ever read. You know, um, let me give you an example from this. Right. So criticism, comments news reporting, um, teaching. Um, and that, that teaching limitation, I will tell you, is very much about face-to-face. -face. So for example, universities can't just use anything they want any way they want and say, it's all about teaching. No, it it's classroom, in the classroom itself kind of teaching. 
um, scholarship and research, academics like to write journals and do research, journal articles and do research on things. And they can include some portions of copyrightable work in that research. Let's keep going. Um, actually, let's go back one slide if that's possible. If not, that's okay. Yeah, so fair use. So I just want to say one other thing about the specificity. So the copyright law says fair use, here's what it is. There's several conditions about fair use in the copyright law. It says you have to consider these factors. But the fact of the matter is the copyright law does not give a perfect roadmap for every scenario that might be a fair use. Because it's a defense, the way it works is judges get to decide if it's a fair use or not. Examples of what has been found to be a fair use or not a fair use don't come out of the copyright law itself if you go and try and read the law. They come out of court cases. And so fair use, trying to rely on fair use instead of getting permission is always a bit risky. Because unless your facts are exactly the same as a case that has been decided by a, a judge somewhere and then says, no, this example is crystal clear. It's fair use, right? If your exact examples, uh, you might have slightly different facts and it could be a different judge, you could end up with a different outcome. And so relying on fair use is, is a bit risky. You have to make sure that the thing you're doing has been very clearly, you know, established by court cases to be fair use. You know, you don't ever want to be in front of a judge, frankly, letting them decide if that thing you've done is legal or not. Like you don't ever really want to be there. And so um, I'll give you one example, although um, this will also, you know, date me in terms of age. Weird Al Yankovic. You could look him up if you've never heard of him. Weird Al Yankovic was an artist and recording artist who put out recordings where he changed the words to popular songs like Michael Jackson beat it. He turned into eat it hilarious. And the music videos were hilarious. Um, and those were pretty squarely an example of fair use under this parody parody type of fair use exception, but he always got permission anyway. He didn't want to risk a court saying, Nope, that, that one, nope. So, you know, pay all of your money that you just made doing that over to this other party and pay attorney's fees and pay all this money out because the court disagreed with him. It was much safer for him and his record company, his music publishing company, to get permission to create those parodies, even if they might have won a fair, loose law, a fair use lawsuit. Um, so relying on fair use is risky. You don't want to do it without really being clear that it would stand up in court. Okay, let's move on then. Thanks. So, whoop, hold on. AirPod fell out of my ear. Okay, hopefully you guys can still hear me. They'll text me in the chat if somehow I put myself on mute. Um, okay, so there's another kind of protection out there besides copyright. We're going to actually now pivot away from copyright. It's something called a right of publicity or personality. So an individuals, individuals have an exclusive right to authorize how their name, voice, signature, or likeness is used. Um, and you can see here for the picture on the slide, this is a famous image of Marilyn Monroe um, uh, created by Andy Warhol. Very, very famous piece of art. Um, Warhol did not get permission to do this, except that was okay because of where Marilyn died. What? Yeah. So this right of publicity is really complicated and it's not federal law. It's not a federal law the way copyright law is federal law. Copyright law is the same across everywhere. Rights of publicity are not. They are different in every state. Wow, that's pretty hard to keep track of. Keeps lawyers really busy. So rights of publicity are different in every state. And so the rights in that state, how they apply to people who are alive, how they apply to people who have died, are different. Marilyn Monroe was a resident of New York State when she died. And New York State did not protect the rights of public 
of deceased people. So Andy Warhol could paint this of her, this photographs that were then adjusted and colored. He could do that without her permission. But one guess, which state has the most protective rights of publicity of all the states? And it's not New York and it's not California and it's not Florida. Drum roll, please. Has Elvis left the building? It's Tennessee. It's Tennessee. Thanks to the Elvis Presley estate and their influence on the state legislature, the most protective rights for public rights of publicity for deceased people is Tennessee. Um, and frankly, the rights to protect Elvis's name, image, signature, likeness are going to go on forever. Basically, they're going to carry on until his estate stops using them. That's going to be like never. Um, so very different state by state. Um, so the, the takeaway here is if your art is going to use the name, voice, signature, image, or likeness of some living or deceased person, you need to be really careful. Um, you may need to talk to a lawyer, um, you know, especially when you're talking about mass reproductions of something. So it's interesting, rights of publicity, they, they kind of rub up against, there's a bit of a friction with free speech. Um, so I could create a painting right now of Elvis Presley. I could create a painting right now. You guys could watch me and you would watch copyright ownership be created just like that. I could do a painting of Elvis Presley right now and I could hang that in a gallery in Broward County. And that's okay. It's, it's one piece of art and that falls under free speech. If I then print up, make that into a poster and do a mass printing of that poster and sell it online, now I start infringing on rights of publicity. Who knew it was that complicated? It is. So the very quick version is if you're creating one piece of art, that's it, and you're selling that one piece of art or you're exhibiting that one piece of art, you're okay. Um, but once you start then making reproductions of that beyond a handful of, of copies of that, you start now looking at possibly infringing someone's right of publicity, time to do some legal research, maybe time to talk to a lawyer. Okay, next slide. All right, so um, so forgive me, I don't have my slides right in front of me, so sometimes I get ahead of myself, but it's good. Then you know a lot of what I just said is gonna be in the materials that you get. So let's just recap it. Um, so original art, painting, photograph, generally free speech. It's okay if you don't have permission, um, but that mass reproduction can kick in that permission. Tricky, you need to tread carefully. There you go, so there's a slide. Okay, so let's pivot to trademark. What is trademark? So trademark is a word, a phrase, a symbol, or a design or a combination of that that identifies and distinguishes a source of goods from one party from another. A service mark essentially distinguishes a service as opposed to a product, right? Some businesses provide services, not a physical product. So what does it mean to own a trademark? Just like copyright, you know, when you own a piece of intellectual property, it means you have exclusive control over it. That's what it means. And so um, ownership of a trademark means you get exclusive control over how it is used. But understand here, what you didn't see in this paragraph that describes what it is was about creativity, okay? It's not about the creative nature of authorship. It's about the identification of goods, so you could take um, a trademark image, let's call it a logo, take a logo, and that logo could be copyrightable as a graphical work. Absolutely, completely. It's a drawing, right? It's a graphical work. You can copyright it. But from a trademark perspective, it's not about protecting it from a copyright point of view. It's about saying people recognize this trademark. It says these goods came from McDonald's. These goods came from Nike, right? Right as opposed to some other brand. It's really about product identification. And that's critical because infringement of a trademark is not about, wow, you know, that's an exact graphical image. It's about confusing the public. Trademark infringement's different. It's a different concept than copyright infringement. Okay, next slide. Um, desire to 
to prevent unfair competition. So how do you get to have trademark ownership? Oh, okay, there goes my light again. All right, well, we will, I'm just gonna scoot a little here and uh, you know, uh, my spotlight went out. It's been on USB too long, but you can still see me, I think. So, um, so how do you become a trademark owner? You simply start using the mark in commerce. That's all you have to do. It's like copyright ownership. Once you start using it, you have trademark protection even if you haven't registered it yet. How cool is that? So understand, you don't have to go racing to a lawyer like the first day you thought of anything. As soon as you write your poem and you're like, I'm gonna start a, a, a business, you don't have to sort out your trademark as the very first thing, okay? Protections begin as soon as you start using it in commerce. Um, now, being first to register has some benefits, it means you've staked your claim to it so that some, you know, other restaurant down the street can't grab the same name or some other film studio or some other record company or recording artist can't grab it first. But, you know, who is entitled to that trademark is going to look at who was first using it in business. That, that's an important factor. Um, okay, next slide. So how do you register it? Again, it's an option. It's an option like copyright registration, option with benefits. So for this, you register it with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Um, you cannot register a mark that's already being used by somebody in the same class. So you might have seen an example where, um, you know, this, this example I was talking about yesterday. So everyone's using Zoom, right? All these meetings, I'm in eight hours of Zoom meetings a day. I'm sure some of you have been on Zoom. I didn't even know what Zoom was before March. So there's Zoom, yeah? But you know what? The word Zoom is used in other kinds of business. So check this out. Super confusing as I'm planning for how we're going to have classes in the fall at the Frost School of Music. There's a microphone, a kind of microphone called, the brand of the microphone is Zoom. So I'm sitting here trying to tell my professors you're going to use a Zoom microphone while you're on Zoom with your students. Trademark clash. Um, but you know what? it's different because they're in different classes. So Zoom for video conferencing, video conferencing is a different class than microphones. Um, so you might see other examples, I'm sure you can think of some where more than one company is using the same name on their products or their brands, but they provide fundamentally different services. So what happens is when you file a trademark registration, you have to lay out all the classes that you are making that claim for. And generally the goal is while being as legitimate as possible, is to make that statement as broad as possible, to try to prevent others whose business is similar, could start looking kind of similar to yours from being able to use the same mark. Next slide. So if you register, same sort of thing. If you're gonna file a lawsuit um, from a federal perspective, you need to have federally registered. If you didn't register federally, you were just using the mark, but you never did a federal registration, you can still sue them in state court for unfair competition and some other kinds of uh, legal claims. Next. How do you register? Go to the uspto.gov website. Um, the current fee, there's a fee for something called a micro entity, um, which is where you, you have under $189,000 of revenue. That's a lot of up and coming folks. Um, those fees can start at $50 send in the form, you send in a fee, you send in a depiction of the mark or the, the name of the, the company or the name of the recording artist. <clears throat> you don't need a lawyer to do this, but it might be a really good idea. And the reason why is those classes, the classes you want to claim, that's an important choice. So for example, you could be a recording artist and I'm just going to claim uh, recordings. And I would say, no, you need to try to claim all entertainment. You know, what happens then when there's an actor? that's in movies and you want to be in movies, right? Think about all the musicians who've now become movie stars. So you want to claim all the different entertainment categories, not just music. And you would not necessarily know that. So unlike copyright registration, that's a bit simpler. Trademark registration, you maybe want some legal guidance here. Um, you could look at other simpler, cheaper services like legal Zoom. Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about it. There's the word Zoom again. I, that didn't even occur to me until I just saw it on the slide. <laughs> Another example of trademarks. There you go. So you may want to look at a service like that. Okay, next slide. 
Um, so unlike copyright, where you don't have to have ever shared your work with anybody else ever, ever before you register it, you have to actually either be using the market business. So, you know, your website's up and running, your products are out there, you are like legit in business, or you have to have a bona fide intention to use the mark. You can't really be trademark squatter, right? Where you're like, I'm just going to file a bunch of claims and I have no real intention to ever use these in business. I just think that's a cool word and I'm going to lock it down before someone else can lock it down, right? It has to be a bona fide intention. So maybe your business hasn't started yet, but you're, it's in the works, <clears throat> right? So that's what it takes to file a registration. You'll have to you'll have to explain that in the registration. Um, you know, it used to be a lot more complicated to, um, and, and it has to be interstate business. So from a federal perspective, to have federal protection, you have to be engaged in or have a bona fide intention to engage in interstate commerce, as in selling products and services across state lines. Now, pre-internet, you know, unless you were shipping products to other states and you were sending out a mailing catalog, a lot of people did that, it'd be more difficult for a really small, you know, let's say a local dry cleaner to show that they were doing interstate commerce. But nowadays with a website, um, especially if you're in the arts and somebody could be buying your art from anywhere in the world, let alone in different states, that's interstate commerce. Um, so that's not that's not a hard challenge. Um, you know, if you're just one art gallery down the block, you don't have a website at all. And the only way people know you is if they drive by or they, you know, see you in the yellow pages, I guess you would not be doing interstate commerce. Um, so if you're the only one, <clears throat> if you're the only one using it in the state um, and you cannot get federal registration for the sorry, if you are the only one using it in the state, you cannot get federal registration. Like, right. That's my example of an art gallery down the block has no website no internet presence. Um, you would have to prove that people somehow find you, call you and buy stuff from you, maybe by phone or by mail order. Um, so, okay. Symbols. You can use the R in a circle. If you have federally registered, um, you can use a little TM if you are using a mark, but have not registered it. And use of the symbols is optional. Keep going. Um, so we're going to pivot now to the last topic. I will go through these kind of quickly, but we're, uh, again, really, you've got the slides. You're going to have these this text, and I'm really just pointing you to references that are going to be helpful because uh, the information, you know, is is more than we can cover in a in a session like this. So if you want to grant someone else permission to use your intellectual property, which is generally what you need to do in order to monetize it, in order to make revenue from it, there are several different kinds of permission you can grant. The first is something we call a non-exclusive license. This lets you grant the same permission to multiple people. Um, that's pretty common, frankly, in, in how we exploit content. Next. Or you could grant an exclusive license. That means that I am letting you and only you use my work this way. Um, so contrast, you know, and, and an exclusive license is something you really don't want to do unless they're going to pay you, you know, a fair amount of money. Because if you think that work would generate a lot of revenue from other people, you don't want to lock it down that way. So imagine I'm a musician and one film company wants to use my music in their movie. I don't want to grant that to them exclusively because then that would mean every other film company that comes knocking on my door, I have to say no to them. I don't want to do that. I would grant them a non-exclusive license so that as other film companies come and knock on my door, I could say yes. Um, so exclusive license, you know, you're really letting that party and only that party use your work. Um, another example is basically selling your copyright, like flat out, getting the money, walking away from it. We call that a copyright buyout. They are now the owner. You didn't just give them permission. You sold the whole thing to them. Um, there is a special right under the copyright law called a termination of transfers, right? Which even if you do this, even if you sell it, it's kind of a crazy concept. About 35 years later, you can come back to that party you sold it to and say, hey, I want to take that back. Think about it. if you sold your house, you came back 35 years later and knocked on the door and you're like, I want my house back. Um, you can actually do that under copyright law. OK, next. Um, so every contract where you're granting permission, um, you need to make sure this information is in this this license or this buyout. So what kind of permission is being granted? Is it one of those three categories? How long is that permission for? What's the length of time? What rights are you letting them do, right? You might be saying, I am simply allowing you to publicly display this work. 
or are you allowing them to reproduce and distribute the work? What exactly are you letting them do? And it's a great idea to connect that to those rights under copyright law from a, a, a language point of view. Um, what are the rights of each party? Um, even though you're letting them do something, are there certain things you say they've got to come back to you and ask each time? Um, so you want to lay out who's allowed to do what and what compensation are you going to receive? What money is being paid to you? Is it a one-time payment? Do you keep getting paid on a regular basis when something happens? These are things you have to make sure are in that license or that, that buyout in any contract granting permission. Um, if you have to provide somebody a contract, they're saying to you, well, send me your contract. I want to use this. You're like, sure. Awesome. They say, send me your contract. Um, if you can't find a lawyer, you could get on a search engine, your favorite search engine, Google, or whatever it is. And you could do, you could try and find examples of the kind of license or document you're trying to create. There's a lot of templates out there. Some of these are really simple. There are one or two pagers. Not all of this has to involve a lawyer, especially if it's a one-time thing. It's pretty simple. I'm letting you do this for this one thing and that's it. You don't necessarily have to have a lawyer. If it's something that's going to be forever or many, many years, a lot of money is involved, then you want a lawyer. Um, legal problems. So if someone's infringing your copyright, you can file a copyright infringement lawsuit in federal court. You want a lawyer for that. If someone's using your trademark, you could also file a lawsuit in federal court if you federally registered it. If you didn't federally register it, you'll sue them in state court. If someone's not following the terms of a contract you've signed with them, you will file a breach of contract lawsuit against them in state court. Um, and in all these cases, you want to find a lawyer who deals with the topic that your contract or your infringement is about. Not all lawyers do copyright and trademark. You know, there are different lawyers that do different forms of intellectual property and not all lawyers are, you know, licensed to, to file something in federal law in federal court. So you need the right kind of lawyer. How do you find a lawyer? So first place you can go Florida Bar, Entertainment, Arts and Sports Law section of the Florida Bar. That's easel.info. <clears throat> There's a men members section. Click on that. And basically it's showing you a Florida Bar site with all the members of the section. Emails, phone numbers are right there. Um, there is a volunteer lawyers for the arts group in Miami. There's the website there. And um, pretty much any lawyer will meet with you for a free initial consultation. Go talk to them. They'll tell you what they think the next step is and what they might charge you. So there's no harm in going to talk to one. So some resources. This is the list I'm going to run through quickly. You have these written. So we're going to go through this section pretty quick. Great book called How to License and Clear Copyrighted Materials Online and Off. This book is going to be helpful when you're trying to figure out how to get permission from other people to use their copyrighted works in what you're creating. Great book. <clears throat> you can get, you can go look at all these on Amazon. It's less than $20. Um, it's got sample contracts in it, a link to supporting website with lots of, you know, examples, templates. It discusses just about every kind of work you can think of. So great book to have. Music. More complicated than a lot of other things because you have the underlying musical work, think sheet music, and you have the recording itself, two different copyrights, two different sets of parties. So when you want to use music, it, usually getting the permission is like double as complicated. So many books on this subject on Amazon, two favorites of mine, Music, Money, and Success by Jeff and Todd Brabeck, two identical twin brothers that are close friends of mine, and, and an all-time favorite, All You Need to Know About the Music Business by Donald Passman. Visual arts. So Amazon's got a lot of books on art law, visual art law, photograph law. There's a great website called the Artist Rights Society of New York, but their website is good for anybody in Florida too. And the Graphic Artists Guild, um, their website also has some great information. Jewelry. So jewelry is considered a visual work under copyright. There is a book called The Craft Artist Legal Guide, Protecting Your Work, Save on Taxes, Maximize Profits. Um, and if you design a new kind of clasp, for example, you may also be able to get a design patent. Um, we didn't talk much about patents, actually. Very little other than on the very first slide. I will tell you this. You need a lawyer to deal with patents crazy complicated. When I was in law school, my patent professor showed us the patent application for a stapler and it was like 200 pages long. So patents, you need a lawyer. I'll just say that about patents. Okay, next. Fashion. So fashion, over the years since 1914, Congress has considered multiple times protection for fashion. They still haven't quite got there. 
Um, they added protection for something called the design of a vessel hull, um, which people refer to a lot in fashion, but there's still no protection for a fashion design. You could protect a drawing, but then if somebody else, you know, creates another version of that dress, it's very similar. Um, you can't get protection for that. You might be able to get trademark protection for a, or design patent. There's a book called The Practical Guide to Fashion Law and Compliance you can look at. Films can be complicated. You know, if you've got an underlying story that was written in there, you're involving music. Films can be quite a lot of work. There's tons of books on this, tons and tons of them. Um, you have to worry about trademarks that might be showing up in some of your scenes, like you're filming a scene in front of McDonald's. Um, so it can, you know, there's all kinds of complex legal issues as well, like getting location rights and permitting from the city. So there's a great book all about it. Um, you can check it out right there. Lots of books on this topic. If you're making a film, you probably do want to talk to a lawyer. Text, so poems, short stories, long stories, um, rights of publicity may be kicked in if you're writing um, about a famous person, you know, and you've got that friction with um, the First Amendment in terms of unauthorized biographies. Um, fair use might kick in as well. Um, again, just look on the internet for, you know, um, literary copyright resources, lots and lots of them. And that's it. So this has been fantastic. Let me uh, recenter myself there. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, it's been great to spend this time with you. Um, I apologize for not taking questions from you, but, you know, what tends to happen is everyone has their own set of facts. Um, and not only do I not really want them to share you, you to share them in such a public forum, you know, it would not be safe for a doctor to like diagnose your medical condition by a handful of facts. You might tell them over a, over a camera, you know, setting, they'll want to examine you and ask you lots of questions because there may be things that you don't even know make a difference that they know. So, um, so I'm, I'm not a fan of trying to diagnose legal problems, um, in a class setting. Um, so we're not going to take questions today. Um, the best thing to do is to look at those resources I've shared with you. If you want to talk to a lawyer, um, we're going to put up here in a minute the easel.info website. Go and find yourself. There you go. Find yourself a lawyer. Um, you can meet with them for free for the first time and then see what they tell you. And they might say, I can fix this for you for $100. Or so they might say, this is going to be a big, complicated, you know, whatever it is. And it's going to cost a lot more money, but then at least you'll know. So that's the best thing for you to do. Um, but the, the best client for a lawyer is one that's already done some homework. Save yourself so you don't have to sit there and let the lawyer explain copyright to you. Um, take, do some homework so that when you go in there, you know how to describe what your situation is. Um, so that's, that's it from me on protecting your rights. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you for your wealth of knowledge is an understatement. And we appreciate everything you shared today. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. Everybody stay safe out there. Thank you. You too. Wow. I, I know that everybody received so much valuable information from today, from Serona, from Raphael. Um, make sure to not worry. All of this is going to be available as a replay. Um, and I want to make sure to remind you Session three might have ended today, but we're not done just yet. We still have a few more of these throughout the summer. Some things to anticipate on our next sessions include consumer platforms for selling your work, civic and community engagement, and then we are going to wrap up the summer by revisiting your business plans to make sure you have what you need. So as a reminder, we're gonna be back here in two weeks, so mark your calendar right now, Saturday, July 25th, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We will be doing session number four, which is consumers and community. So a little bit about what that is, is you're gonna talk, they're gonna talk about understanding your consumers, their preferred communication channels, and how to develop a communication strategy. And you're also going to explore collaborations and resources around civic engagement. So something that pertains to what is going on in the world right now. So it's perfect timing. I want to make sure to remind you that all of this is brought to you by Broward County's Cultural Division. And it's moderated by me, Angela, from Art Hive Magazine. Before you leave and log off of social media, Go ahead and click subscribe. 
If you're on YouTube to Broward Arts, go ahead and click and follow Broward Arts on Facebook. And while you're there, you can click and check out Art Hive Magazine too, because we'd love for you to continue to follow both of us. Our mission is to continue to give creatives just like out, just like all of you out there, all of this valuable information. And so I hope you enjoy and I look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Have a great creative afternoon.